We present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Andre Melle in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again we have our four most experienced players of the game who are going to do battle in this verbal battle of wits and try and win Just a Minute. I'm going to ask each one of them if they can speak for Just a Minute on some unlikely subject without hesitation, without repetition and without deviating from the subject on the card which is in front of me. And according to how well they do this they will win points or lose them. And uh, so let us begin the show this week with Kenneth Williams. Kenneth. Will you talk to us for 60 seconds, if you can, on sensible winter underwear? <laughs> A good subject to start the programme with, and you start now. Well, of course, I always believe in these old sayings, don't cast a clout till May is out. And therefore, I do not leave off the interlock woolens until that period is reached. You can't beat wool. Indeed, it has been written on posters that there is no substitute for it. Just like myself, there is no replica. <laughs> Nothing more beautiful nor cosy does exist in this land than something wool on me. People uh, have said, Andre how dare I be? I'm just started. <laughs> You've been going on very well for over 30 seconds, and Andre has challenged you. Andre Mary, what is your challenge? A repetition, two wools. Uh, sensible winter underwear. Wool is not in the title on the card, so it's perfectly correct. You have repeated wool, Kenneth. So I agree with Andre's challenge. She takes a point and the subject, and she has a 27 seconds for sensible winter underwear starting now. If you are a woman, this is very difficult to find. Those thick woolly vests are not suitable because they ruckle round the arms where the sleeves are and put on inches round your waist. A Spencer, that's a good thing. Uh, Peter Jones challenged you, why? A repetition of round. Yes, indeed, you did have too much roundness there, Andre. <laughs> repetition of round. So I agree with Peter's challenge. He gains a point. 14 seconds left for sensible winter underwear, Peter, starting now. I don't know what the perfect solution is. Something that one can wear on television when the lights are very hot and also still have on when one is queuing up for a bus when the program is over. <laughs> Little glimpses of people's life you get from this program. I saw Peter Jones in his sensible winter underwear queuing for a bus. <laughs> <laughs> that whistle, by the way, tells I wear my that... raincoat over them, of course. <laughs> Ah, good. We're reassured, Peter. That whistle tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that particular moment gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Peter Jones, so at the end of the first round, he has a lead of one over Andre Melly, and the others have yet to score. Um, Peter Jones, your turn to begin, and the subject is my favourite sport. Can you talk to us about that for just a minute, starting now? Yes, I'm very pleased to talk about it because it's something that my wife is able to join me in. We both <laughs> love going out into the country and hunting for houses. Not that we are unhappy about the domicile in which we exist, but we do always have a dream that somewhere over the hill or possibly over the sea on the and continent... And there's a challenge from Kenneth Williams. Two overs. Yes, you went over too much. <laughs> there. So I agree with Kenneth's challenge. He gains a point and he has now 33 seconds for my favourite sport starting now. Well, it's unfortunate because I don't have one. And someone has challenged you. Clement Freud presses buzzer first. What is it, Clement? Hesitation. A hesitation. I agree with... <laughs> Clement's challenge, he gains a point for a correct one, has 30 seconds to continue with my favourite sport starting now. My favourite sport is baiting Kenneth Williams. <laughs> I creep down Baker Street at dawn of a Tuesday with a piccadillo in one hand and a gherkin in another, while a string vest contains newts. And reaching the north end of that thoroughfare, I have a poster of the aforesaid team member of this game, just a minute, and get all sorts of... <laughs> Andre Melly challenged you. Uh, uh, hesitation. I think so. As he was doing so well, kind of find different phrases for the same w uh, expression all the way through. And he almost made it, but there were only four seconds left. Andre got in with a correct challenge, and she continues with my favourite sport starting now. 
My favorite sport is called Freedom at Dyke. She was the games and gym mistress. <laughs> So Andre, getting in just before the whistle, kept the subject, gained the extra point for speaking when the whistle went, and has a lead of one over everybody else at the end of the second round. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The most fun I ever had. Can you tell us about that in 60 seconds, starting now? The most fun I ever had, starting now, is a fantastic woman sitting in the eighth row with purple hair and a glass eye. <laughs> We are going to have such a fantastically cheerful time when this program is over. And I'm sorry about speaking in the future, but since I came in and I noticed that astonishing twitch of my left toe as I caught her eye, and she mine, we sit there. I'm going to stop now because it's uh, Andre all... Andre made his challenge. Right? Because he was going to stop there. Well, he didn't stop, did so, he? So why did you uh, challenge? The, the hesitation he was about to do. <laughs> Now, Andre, uh, uh, no, because you see, he actually hadn't stopped. He was still going on on the subject. Actually, he was talking in the future, so he was at that moment being devious, but you didn't challenge He the was deviation. being devious. Too late now. <laughs> no, he hadn't actually stopped. He was still going on. Until we get a correct challenge, Clement Freud keeps the subject uh, with another point, of course, for a wrong challenge. And there are 26 seconds left starting now. On March the 18th, 1951, it was picnic time. Mummy, Daddy, Auntie Mabel and Uncle Jim came into my bedroom at 9.15 and said, It's outing! And the Cherbourg was outside, and the car, the chauffeur, the maid, the butler, we all went to Lowestoft and then Yarmouth, uh, Andre, up the coast to Sheringham. Andre's challenge, your outing, I'm really? sorry. Uh, oh. Why is your challenge this time, Andre? Well, out of snobbism. I mean, you can't have all those many servants. It's too embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, and he probably hasn't, and probably never Devious. did. Devious. But Devious he never established anything. that these servants had anything to do with him. And he was still keeping going on the most fun I ever had. He might have had it with the butler and the parlour maid and the cook, for all we know. All right, but you have another point. But he hadn't deviated from the subject to be perfectly accurate, Andre, so he keeps it, and there are eight seconds left, starting now. She wore a Macintosh, and I had Wellington boots, when the man came along and said, with a whip and a face like yours... <laughs> Delighted to see, uh, that the whistle went just then before we got really devious. I think we're about to have it. But Clement Freud started with the subject. In spite of challenges, kept going on the subject. He now has a lead. He has four. Andre has three. Peter Jones has two. And Kenneth Williams has one point at the end of that round. And Andre Melly, your turn to begin. Why good cooking is a mark of civilization. Can you talk on that particular subject for 60 seconds, starting now? Clement Freud, as we all know, is a very good cook and a mark of civilization, if ever I saw one. So the reason uh, is... Kenneth Williams has challenged. Deviation. A man cannot be a mark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he can be a mark of civilization. I quite agree. No, I quite... And especially Clement Freud, so that we... <laughs> uh, I agree with your challenge, Ken. If you gain a point and you have 50 seconds for why good cooking is a mark of civilization, starting now. Well, of course, good cooking is not a mark of civilization, and indeed, empirically, in Athens, which was one of the most advanced civilizations we've ever known, the cooking was appalling. <laughs> they used to do this stuff on a spit, you know, and it used to revolve round. They used to throw this grease on, and they used to... All of them are terrible indigestion! <laughs> and there was all the bismuth going round afterwards, and the most awful regurgitation. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you see. Clement Freud is challenged before you got your belch in. Regurgitation. A uh, wonder? Is repetition. Of what? <laughs> coming back. It's horrible. <laughs> give you the line to say it was coming back instead of me saying it, but it's all right. Um, regurgitation, repetition. A very good challenge. Give him a point for a clever idea, but as Kenneth Williams did not deviate from the subject of why good cooking is a mark of civilization, he keeps the subject and continues for 26 seconds, starting now. The assumption has always been, of course, that indeed the most sophisticated nation in Europe, but undoubtedly the French, do hold the field here, that the best kind of food can be obtained in that country, the best cooking, I mean. And um, Clement Freud, why do you challenge? Repetition of best. Yes, I agree with your challenge. You take a point and you have ten and a half seconds for why good cooking is a mark of civilization starting now. I suppose if you went down the high street of Vaduz, which is the capital of Liechtenstein, 
and came across a toad in the hole, you would be justified in thinking that... <laughs> I'm fascinated to know what we would be justified in thinking, Clement. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, saved by the whistle. You'll get an extra point for speaking when the whistle went, Clement, and you've increased your lead at the end of that round. Peter Jones, your turn. Old jokes. Do you know any, Peter? But if not, can you talk about them for 60 seconds, starting now? I'm very pleased to talk about them because I collect them, just as other people go round picking up antiques or storing bottles. And Andre Melly challenged you. No hesitation. Yes, and she goes around picking up points because I agree with that hesitation, Andre. You have 50 seconds for old jokes starting now. They're called chestnuts very often. I don't really know why. Comedians tell them and do them up in different ways to try and make them topical. I hate them. I get very nervous when people start telling jokes because I very rarely see the point. I believe there are only a <laughs> Clement Froy got in first. Hesitation. Hesitation, I agree, Clement. 33 seconds for old jokes starting now. A man went into a chemist shop and said, <laughs> Do you sell talcum powder? And the chemist said, Certainly, sir, will you walk this way? And the man said, If I could walk that way, I wouldn't need the substance that I can. <laughs> Kenneth Williams has challenged your old joke. Well, of course, he said, Walk twice. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he had to say it to say the joke. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I say, I say, I say, I say. Yes. <laughs> I say you won a point there, uh, <laughs> Kenneth, and you have the subject of old jokes and 20 seconds for them starting now. A bloke rushed into the pub and he said, Mine's a light, and the barmaid poured a bucket of cold water all over him. And another bloke rushed into the pub and he said, Mine's a Another bloke rushed into the pub and he said, Mine's a large one, so you order not both, in. <laughs> They are yeah. both very old jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could see the whiskers. Um, <laughs> you were challenged after the first one, actually. Who challenged me? Your colleague I beside you. Did you have the disloyalty? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Emma, why did you challenge that first Two old blokes. Joke? Repetition. What's that? Repetition of bloke. Oh, yes. it's true, I did. There it's were true. two blokes in the first yes, joke. Yes, I'm right sorry. I do apologise. Yeah, but you got the joke and you got the laugh. So <laughs> That's Ken, true. And he had two walks. And he got That's it. true. So he's got it back again. Uh, uh, Clem, another point to you. Uh, 14 seconds, old joke, starting now. This gentleman went into a pharmaceutical store and said, do you sell toothbrushes? And the assistant said, certainly, sir, we have three kinds. Bristle, two and six. <laughs> nylon, three and nine. Alligator hair, five shillings. <laughs> and the man thought for a while and said, I would like to purchase the latter because I have never heard of it before. To which the chimist said, I can't go on because it's a filthy story and I thought the whistle would blow. <laughs> Andre challenged you a long while back, actually. We wanted you to go on because I knew the end of it. I want to know if you dare to give the <laughs> <three up. laughs> Andre, what was your challenge way back? Uh, well, I wanted to save him the embarrassment because I heard it too. <laughs> <laughs> Deviation, because I knew it was. Oh, no, I'm afraid he, he hadn't actually deviated from the old joke, so it's back with you, Clement. Uh, You've still right, got old finish jokes. it. Four seconds. <laughs> Four seconds left, starting now. As he was about to conclude his purchase, yet another customer entered through the portals of the Emporium, <laughs> dealing in articles such as <laughs> your very clean story gave you uh, an increased lead at the end of that round over all the others and clement freud we're back with you your turn to begin <laughs> and the subject is Charm. So can you talk to us for 60 seconds on that subject, starting now? Charm is a very elusive quality, sometimes to be seen in patrons of chemist shops, who use <laughs> talcum powder, toothbrushes, ointments, and other emulsions to multiply the already existent factor of charm already inherent in their uh, person. Kenneth Williams has charmed. Two already. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, there was indeed, right. yes. Mm. Well, listen, Kenneth. So, you have the subject now of charm, Kenneth. And you have 40 seconds <laughs> and, charm. and you're looking your most charming at the present moment, I must say. And the audience have recognised it, that's why they're laughing. And um, you start now. 
while of course there are various varieties. I do symbolize theatrical charm, and then there is the charm that exerted by the man who has these snakes and makes them do all kinds of exciting things and interest various passers-by in marketplaces in Morocco. I have stood enchanted watching these gyrations and these reptiles wind themselves round in the air and the flute there goes on. <laughs> I think Kenneth Williams has found a new way to play this game. He speaks so quietly, the other three can't hear it. <laughs> we didn't know what you said, Kenneth. That's called whether... actual dulcet tones. Yes. It was so dulcet, we didn't know whether you were repetitious, hesitationist, or um, deviational. So there we are. Uh, Andre Mary, we go from charm to the subject of powder. So can you talk to us about that for 60 <laughs> seconds, starting now? This is a particularly boring subject, which I will try to talk about for 60 seconds. It comes in different shades, from pale pink to green, if you have very red cheeks and want to get the glow down. There is the talcum variety, which can be found in chemist shops, together with toothbrushes, <laughs> toothpaste, and other commodities. Not very expensive. I don't quite know what it's made of. You can have it in large boxes or small ones, put it in a compact, gold, gilt, silver, whatever you wish. I'm terribly fed up talking about this, but no... And Clement Freud has helped you. Deviation. Why? I'm terribly fed up talking about this. It has nothing to do with powder. She's actually meant, I'm fed up talking about this, which was powder, so she hasn't deviated from powder, so she still keeps the subject, having got another point for a wrong time. Thank you. And there are 25 seconds left starting now. There is the baby variety used to keep the small infant from getting chapped in uh, the neck. Kenneth Williams' wife who chapped. There's no such thing as a small infant. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you put someone under pressure. Their infants become infants. <laughs> so you have the subject, Kenneth, in a point, of course, and... Um, 19 seconds for powder starting now. Well, when you are ablaze with acne, as I have frequently been, <laughs> then you do apply Peter the Jones odd... Peter Jones has challenged your acne. Who? Um, Peter Jones. How dare you. Can't be ablaze with acne. You haven't acne. seen me, especially in puberty. You never... <laughs> you asked me mother, she had a terrible job. Pustules everywhere. I was covered in them. Oh, it was horrible sight. People used to say, cover him up, for goodness sake. <laughs> blanket over me half the time. Sackcloth and ashes was my lot. I could tell you things and make your hair curl. <laughs> All right, our hairs are curling. We're very good. Enough. I'll tell you what I'll do, because I think, technically speaking, if you use a phrase, you can use it sort of... Uh, of course, I was using it euphemistically, of course, idiosyncratically. No. Are you lying? Boyantly, yes. yes. But uh, let, let the audience be the final judge. If they think that that phrase of a blaze with acne is not <laughs> a good one, if they consider that was devious, let them be the final judge on this difficult point. I'll put it to them. If they agree with Peter's challenge, then would they cheer? If they disagree, would they boo? And would you all do it together now? Blaze! You're a blaze! <laughs> Kenneth Williams, blaze away for 14 seconds on powder starting now. So after applying a little erase, you powder down with, of course, the Poudre Rochelle. This gives one an inviting, <laughs> almost... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged again. A repetition. He what? just changed the language. <laughs> You must have the same word. I said powder and then poudre. Well, you can go so through the whole, right. all the languages uh, in Europe uh, doing that. But actually, that. the word powder is the word on the card, which yes. he didn't repeat. And he hasn't used the word poudre before, so I don't see why he was being repetitious. Well, I thought I'd try. I am in fourth place. <laughs> I... <laughs> I've nothing to lose. I can't... Uh... <laughs> by a wider margin, really. Unless we got well, I'll tell you what you have done. What? Unless we got some more competitors. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, <you can> do. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you have done. You've now got the audience on your side, so maybe next well, time... Well, I don't know. I want them after that. <laughs> I must be fair to the rules of the game because otherwise I get so many brickbacks from you and letters from others. So um, 
Uh, Kenneth, as I disagree with the challenge, you have another point and six seconds for powder starting now. I have frequently disappeared in a flurry of talcum powder and people have said, goodness gracious me, how incredible... <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Williams was speaking then when the whistle went. He gained the extra point. He also got a number of points throughout that uh, particular round with his acne and his powder. So <laughs> he has what he says he loves to do, leap forward. But he hasn't leapt into the lead, but he has crept up most considerably on Clement Freud. Andre Melly is in third place. <laughs> Peter Jones, as you already know from his own lips, is still in fourth place. <laughs> Kenneth, the subject is for you now. I mean, the, it's your turn. And the subject is the great bed of Ware. Can you talk to us about that for 60 seconds, starting now? Well, there was this grate, you see, and they all said, where is this bed? Because they couldn't find out where it was, you see. But the grate was there, but not the bed. So she said, well, look here, we must have the bed. There's a grate, because the grate in the room, obviously, would be there if there was a bed, you see what I mean? <laughs> so they had to say, to install. When it seemed to be installed, they said, to open that very quickly, the entry Richard Spark is where the wax of Ulysses, the stuffy, in the ear drive, and all of us are safely. Yeah. But of course, that wasn't done either. So instead, yeah. they put 12 into the bed, which white cobs became yeah. called the, the bed of wear. Well, long before you started speaking so quickly that nobody could understand you, Clement Freud Jack you. Oh, sorry. What was your challenge, Clement? Uh... <laughs> that was a long time ago. There yes. were five greats. We did at one time establish that even if it's on the card... No, actually, that particular moment I was counting. I have a lot to do. There were three greats, three beds, and three wares. <laughs> <laughs> right, Kenneth Williams has another point for an incorrect challenge, and he has 47 seconds for the great bed of wares starting now. Well, of course, it was this uh, vast... Clement Freud has challenged you again. Repetition of of course. I haven't just started, you fool. I <laughs> How can you say a fool? Your initial 13 second break. That doesn't count in your second game, but you're great nit. <laughs> 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 I don't think you said, of course, in this particular round. Thank you very much, Nick. Exactly. Marvellous chairman. Brilliant. <laughs> 45 seconds for you, Kenneth, on the great bed of wear starting now. It was in this vast public house uh, that this bed was situated. And in that period, people frequently were known to sleep in the same object, you see. So, on one occasion, there is historical record to the effect that 12 people were all in... Clement Freud is challenged by... A repetition of people. Yes, and there was a repetition of 12. So, Clement Freud, I agree with your challenge this time. And there are 15 seconds left for the great bed of wear starting now. I had some friends called the Albus who lived not far from Stevenage. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Williams, why do you challenge? Irrelevant. Devious. <laughs> Devious. You know, Stevenage isn't very far from where. But to do with long, so nothing to do with it, be dear. The things in the British Museum, it's nothing to do with where. But where is in Hertfordshire, and it's not far from Stevenage. If you're going to talk about the great He's got the where. friends that live there now. The bed's been in the museum for years. What's it got to do with it? <laughs> totally irrelevant. You know, it. you know, his friends may be in the museum as well. <laughs> No, he didn't deviate from the subject. There are six seconds left. The great bit of where Clement's starting now. Who were passionately interested in Hertfordshire history, which... Uh, Peter Jones is challenged. Why? Repetition of Hertfordshire. Yeah! yeah, yeah. Hooray! Yeah. 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 Definitely, you said it before. No, no I, said I said Hertfordshire. I said Hertfordshire. Nick's... <laughs> You've changed your affections very rapidly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've gone off him. I've gone off him terribly. This used to be your friend whom you supported against I know, the others. I he's changed the aftershave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got to be fair about this. I said Hertfordshire, not Clement Freud. So it was well tried. You, you, I know we wanted to hear from you, Peter. It was lovely, but um, I've got to be accurate. Two seconds for Cle Cle Clement on the great bed of wear starting now. Taking an underground to Russell Square. <laughs> I'm afraid we have no more time to play just a minute. So it only remains for me to give you the final score. At the end of that, this particular edition of Just a Minute, you might not be surprised to hear, after what you already heard, that Peter Jones was in fourth place. <laughs> uh, he was a little way behind Andre Melly, who was in third place, who was a little way behind Kenneth Williams, who was in a good second place. But Kenneth was undoubtedly beaten by our winner this week, Clement Freud. And if you have enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute, and from all of us here, goodbye.
The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. We present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Andre Melly in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again we have these four experienced people who enjoy this verbal battle of wits, just a minute. And I'm once again going to ask them if they can speak for just a minute on some unlikely subject without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject. And according to how well they do it, they will gain points or lose points to their opponents. That's how we play, and we begin the show this week with Andre Melly. Andre, the subject is jazz. Can you talk to us for 60 seconds on jazz starting now? Jazz originated in America. It was born in the Negro spiritual and the work songs of the prisons. Uh, Kenneth Williams is Deviation. Child. Why? Because uh, it couldn't have been born. Birth is nativity and all the rest of it, and creation, the human activity, and of course this is not a, an activity. Well, actually, of a I've heard kind. people in talking about the creation of something other than a human. Well, I don't care about that. I'm not interested in what you've heard. <laughs> I, I know you're I not have, interested. But I should have the subject, I think, don't I, you? I definitely think you should have the subject. Thank you very but, much. But I would now, like you to get it, I'd like you to get it legitimately. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> think that... And I'm sure you would like to get it legitimately, Oh, too. I don't mind illegitimacy <laughs> at all. I don't mind it at all. Well, all right. I'm afraid I disagree with your challenge, Kenneth. So that means Andre gets a point for a wrong challenge. She keeps oh, the subject. And 51 theory. seconds left for jazz starting now. It then moved to the towns like New Orleans and was found in the honky tonk. Uh, uh, Clement Freud challenge. Why? Deviation. Why? There are no towns like New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> You have a point for a clever challenge. It was not devious. Andre, you keep the subject jazz. 47 seconds left, starting now. And brothels. Bessie Smith was one of the great exponents of blues, the classic form of jazz. Later, Billie Holiday, for example, was a more sophisticated... Uh, uh, <laughs> Kenneth Williams, your challenge. Oh, I had no hesitation there. Yeah. <laughs> you could have had a, for a deviation, a more sophisticated... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that's going to... Uh, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge. You gain a point and you take the subject over. There are 35 seconds for jazz starting now. Its authentic quality was supposedly its involuntary nature. The fact that these people could sit at a piano or with a trumpet, come out with these sounds which were impromptu. That is to say, there was not a score. There was not a formal... Uh, or... Who's at the choice? Oh, I think it's a nerve, you know. I really do. Yes. I was throbbing with it, I was. I was concentrating there. Right at the beginning of the programme, Andre was throbbing with it and you came in with a challenge. Yes, well, she's woman's lib. I'm anti. <laughs> well, the women's lib challenged you on that one. Andre, what was it? There was a repetition of not A and not A. Right one after the other. Not A and not A. Mm. Yes, I thought it was also a repetition of something else, but that one's correct, Andre. You keep the subject. I'm sorry, you get the subject back and have a point for a correct challenge. Jazz... <coughs> 13 seconds, starting now. The frontline instrumentalists intertwine the melody and then one takes over. Occasionally, the bass player, the rhythm section, is allowed to perform on his own. <laughs> <laughs> You were very lucky there, Andre, because Clement Freud challenged you just on your boom 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 and the bell went after the first boom. Otherwise, you're dum 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 dum. 
been definitely repetitious. Whoever speaks in this game when the whistle goes, which tells us, by the way, that 60 seconds is up, gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Andre Meri, so she has a commanding lead at the end of the first round. Kenneth Williams, will you begin the second round? The subject, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Do you mean, oh? <laughs> Can you talk to us about those two characters for 60 seconds, starting now? They derived from a novel which was a load of rubbish about a man <laughs> who, after taking some sort of potion, became another person. And this gave rise to another lot of idiotic ideas connected with the modern word in psychology, schizophrenia, which actually perpetrates... Clement good. Freud, why have you challenged? Schizophrenia, I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't say scritz, you great nit. <laughs> How dare you put words in my mouth, honey? I don't know where they've been, anyway. <laughs> the schizophrenia or schizophrenia, I still think we knew what you meant. 44 seconds for you, Kenneth, with another point on the subject of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde starting now. And, of course, the idea was that they both represented the sides, so to speak, of the same coin. But one day you could have goodness and that in another period, evil. In fact, the turnabout was accomplished with a whole mass of hair. He became hirsute to a degree and these teeth, which were normally quite large, like dentures, became fangish and horrible sort of mucus gathered about the lips, do you see? There was a sort of hydration. Uh, Clement Freud challenge you. Repetition of sort of. Yes, there was a repetition of sort of, which is a bit mean, but it was an accurate challenge. You gain a point, Clement, and there are nine seconds for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He leaves Dr. it till there's nine seconds. Have you noticed that, Peter? <laughs> have you noticed that, Peter? Yes, I have noticed it's that. It's wicked, yes. isn't it? You see, it makes you do all the work, and then he comes in on the end. He's only got nine seconds to fill in, hasn't he? I, I mean, I don't call that willing, do you? No. Peter, what do you think, Peter? <laughs> week, week after week, I try to work out how he does this. There you but are. I can't understand. Well, last it. week you got in after on four seconds a couple of times, Peter. Yeah, but you didn't allow it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you know, I remember all week. I've, it's been <laughs> rankling. <laughs> been rankling. It's been a long week night for all of us, night, hasn't it? Thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, what was the challenge now? Yes, sort of. And, uh, Clement, I agree with the challenge. There are nine seconds left for Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde starting now. There was a film of this name which I saw in a cinema in Tot near Stevan, which featured Spencer Tracy, now deceased, in which Ingrid Bergman... <laughs> On this occasion, Clement Freud was speaking when the whistle went, so he gained that extra point, and he's now taken the lead alongside Andre Melle. Uh, Peter Jones, your turn to begin. In fact, Peter Jones, your turn to hear from you. <laughs> the best day of my life. Can you tell us about that in 60 seconds, Peter, starting now? Well, I am an incurable optimist, obviously, or I wouldn't be here week after week. The best day uh, of... Clement Freud's challenge, why? Repetition. <laughs> <laughs> You are an you're an incurable optimist, Peter, otherwise you wouldn't think of phrases like that to say in just a minute. No, I know, most unfortunate. But actually, week after week, we cannot let go by, and Clement Freud got in, and I agree with the challenge, so Clement, you take a point, and there are 54 seconds left. The best day of my life, Clement, starting now. Day after day. Uh, <laughs> and, uh... Who was to say that Clement Freud isn't uh, sporting? So you want to justify that? You may repeat any word on the phrase, on the card. You always establish Clement, uh, Ian Messenger, you thought of the game. Can he He's do that? He's absolutely right, yes. Thank goodness well, you're here beside me. <laughs> <laughs> so he very cleverly said something which produced a challenge from Andre Melle, and is an incorrect challenge. It means that Clement, of course, gains a point, keeps the subject, the best day of my life, and there are 52 seconds left starting now. Was the 18th of August, 1965 because on this auspicious morning, I awoke to an alarm clock, rose, had grape nuts with milk and brown sugar, and then went outside, mounted a bus, and... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged you. Well, you can't mount a bus. <laughs> 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 Horse, yes, I'll agree with a horse, but not I a bat. I think the picture of Clement Freud sitting astride a bus is... <laughs> <laughs> he may have done some devious things in his time, but I don't think astride a bus, no. 
You may say uh, colloquially mount a bus, but nobody else does. Most people say they get on a bus, Clement, so I'm going to give it against you. Uh, Kenneth has a point on the subject. 35 seconds left for the best day of my life, Kenneth, starting now. The best day of my life in my conscious memory, and I use the term advisedly, brothers, brothers <laughs> and sisters. <laughs> I Clement, speak... I just challenge you. What's his second. challenge? What's your challenge? Brothers and brothers. brothers. You were being too brotherly. <laughs> Lemon Freud has a point, and he has um, 24 seconds for the best day of my life starting now. Shortly after noon, the public conveyance on which I was mounted pulled in. <laughs> Peter Jones has challenged you. Why? Well, he keeps mounting these conveyances. <laughs> And uh, it doesn't seem right. I think on a breakfast of grape repetition. nuts, which he admit he had, he couldn't uh, even attempt it. <laughs> Repetitious. Yes. You've given a different connotation to the mounting now, haven't you, Peter? Well, I... Uh, repetition. Uh, Definitely repetition. So what's your, what's your, um, uh, what's your challenge? Uh, well, what can I have? I'm Deviousness. <laughs> Deviousness, yes. Uh, no, we've had the mounting, repetition. He had the word mount before, didn't he? Yes. yes. It's also devious, anyway. He, he's, well, trying, devious. he's trying to maintain, actually, that he's not being devious by using the word mounting a bus, so I disagree. Peter, you have a point, and you have... I didn't say I was on a bus. Yes, it's all right. Peter has a, Jones has a point, a well-deserved point, yes. and he's well in the game now. He has one point. <laughs> And there are 17 seconds for you. The best day of my life, Peter, starting now. The best day of my life will be tomorrow when Clement Freud wakes me up on the telephone and tells me that I've won this game and congratulates <laughs> me. And then flowers and fruit, baskets of them, will arrive from Kenneth Williams. And then Andre Melly will arrive in person. <laughs> and we shall play Andre Melly has challenged you. Why? Two arrives. You have a point. You were he arrived. You arrived twice, and which was too much for Peter. <laughs> so you get a point. Two seconds left for the best day of my life, starting now. Is today because I am someone who is able to live in the moment. <laughs> so on him. Mary was speaking then with the whistle when she gained the extra point and she's crept up on Clement Freud, which she may not have wanted to do, but she's only now one point behind him, but Clement's still in the lead, and Clement, it is your turn to begin. The subject, the animal I would be if I were not human. Can you have a little moment's thought and tell us in 60 seconds the animal I would be if I were not human? Starting now. The animal I would be would be a hedgehog because I could then not be mounted, which I understand is objectionable to the other members of the team. As a... Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Williams is why you challenge. You seem to come to a halt. You seem to be <laughs> he is so, he is so knocked about this mounty business. No, no. He's so convinced that he's allowed to mount a bus when we think he shouldn't be astride. That he's going to mount a hairbrush. It very cleverly, but unsuccessfully. Uh, Kenneth, you have a correct challenge, a point, and you have 44 seconds for the animal I would be if I were not human starting now. I would like to be, and I assume that's what this question really means. I would. Peter Jones has challenged you. Why? He's making three or four syllables out of one-syllable words again. <laughs> so? Well, it's a kind of way of hesitating without uh, stopping making a noise. Would you like... <laughs> Would you like us to say hesitation? Yes. Obviously, hesitation. <laughs> yes, but I mean, you can't... The audience hesitate. go no further, Peter, because the audience obviously agree with your challenge. So oh, you... thank you very much. <laughs> Why, I would like to say I do appreciate this. It's very kind of you all. So, P. Jones, the animal I would be if I were not human, starting now. I would be our children's cat. We feed her regularly. Children open tins of... Uh, uh, Kenneth Williams challenge. Well, he said children twice. Mm. Yes, he did say children before. Yes, Kenneth, I agree with that challenge. You take over the subject, and there are 19 seconds for the animal I would be if I were not human, starting now. A beautiful leopard with that natural grace those animals possess, in my view, to a greater degree than any other zoological specimen. I would like very much to be a parrot to talk like that on <laughs> <laughs> I must say, Kenneth, you gain a lot of points on the animal thing. In fact, everybody gained points on the animal question, but Kenneth Williams gained so many that he has now leapt into the lead alongside Clement Freud.
It is Andre Melle's turn to begin. Um, Andre, the subject now is the art of being feminine. So can you talk to us on the subject? <laughs> Somebody has sensed what could happen in this particular round. <laughs> Andre, the art of being feminine, 60 seconds, starting now. Smell nice. This is most important. And grooming. Take particular care of your toenails, each and every one. There are many products on the market now, cosmetics, to make sure that you are alluring, feminine, and charming at all times. But there are other things, like, are you char... Um, <laughs> Peter Jones got in first. What was your challenge, Peter? Uh, hesitation. An undoubted hesitation. Do you notice all these raspberries she blows when she hesitates? It's, uh... it's reflex. Uh, Peter Jones, you're creeping up. You have gained another point, and you have 38 seconds on the art of being feminine. <laughs> Starting now. Well, I'm all against the sexes polarising as they are and getting more different. I want to bring them both together. And it's awfully important that women shouldn't rely on teasing and flirting and generally affecting helplessness when, in fact... Uh, Andre Merichan. As a member of the Woman's Lib, I absolutely <laughs> resent and object to that kind of thing. I call it completely devious. It probably is, but it wasn't deviating from the subject on the card. That is not being feminine. Um, the art of being feminine can be interpreted in whichever way you like, and to Peter Jones, that's the way he sees it. It's obviously quite different to the way you see it. Before you hit him over the head for having different ideas to you, can I award him a point and continue the game with 21 seconds on the art of being feminine, Peter, starting now? <laughs> well, I was saying that that's what it wasn't. Uh, Andre Mary challenged. Repetition. He said that's what he was saying. No, he said that's what, what it I wasn't, wasn't saying. So he has another point. And he has... <laughs> Your emotions will take you into great trouble, no, I, Andre. It's, it's just because I'm so fond of him, I want him to get lots of points. <laughs> You're obviously a very good actress too, Andre. You, uh, Peter has now 18, uh, 18 points. 18? <laughs> he has 18 seconds to continue with the art of being feminine starting now. And the one thing that the women... Uh, Clement Freud challenged. I'm very fond of him as well. I'd like him. <laughs> <laughs> I almost feel tempted to award you a point for a good challenge instead of giving it to a point uh, Clement Freud would like to give a point to Peter Jones <laughs> so we're all friends here so I'm sure it'll be gratefully accepted and he will continue with the subject for 17 seconds, Peter, the art of being feminine, starting now. And the one thing that the women's lib people haven't been able to get across to the general public is the fact that men uh, will uh, be... Clement Freud has challenged one. Repetition of fact. Yes, there was more than one fact there. I can understand having started again, you had to bring the fact in. I was interested in what the fact was, actually, but still, Clement Freud <laughs> has a point on this occasion, and there are 11 seconds on the art of being feminine, Clement, starting now. Where's manifestation of femininity? <laughs> Could be, no, uh, on Peter Jones's it's... challenge, why? Right. Uh, hesitation. Long hesitation. <laughs> yes, but I must... Uh, <clears throat> well, <laughs> Kenneth Williams put his arm round him, I saw that. <laughs> I was about to tell the listeners that that is what actually happened. Oh, well, I'm that sorry. It Kenneth... didn't happen. My arm's on the back of this chair. It's not on him at all. What Kenneth was illustrating the art of being feminine right then. <laughs> well, I don't think Clement Freud... inhibited Clement Freud, and I think, to be fair, he was inhibited... Clement Freud's never been inhibited in his life. <laughs> He told us about these adventures, that woman with a glass eye in the aisle. <laughs> Never been any bit of dab, you love. No, Never been any bit of dab. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I will let the audience be the judge on this. If you think that it was unfair that uh, Clement Freud was intimidated, shall I say, when, so he rather dried up on his challenge. If you think it's all within the game and he should have kept going irrespective, then, in other words, if you agree with Peter's challenge, will you cheer? And if you disagree and you're on Clement Freud's side here, will you boo and you all do it together now? <laughs> they feel that you should have kept going in spite of intimidations, Clement, so that means Peter Jones has another point and there are six seconds, Peter, on the art of being feminine starting now. And so forget all this business about saying it with flowers and soft music in romantic <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> Peter Jones, the art of being feminine has taken you into the lead.
with Andre Melli's aggressive help beside you, with the audience on your side, and with Clement Freud being intimidated, you got a number of points in that round, and you now lead Clement Freud by two, and the subject is now with you, Kenneth Williams, and the subject for you now, after that, from the art of being feminine, the subject is power. Could you talk to us about that for 60 seconds, starting now? This, of course, has been remarked upon by Lord Acton, and nobody has expressed it in a better fashion. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is an... In, in, an in. <laughs> Andre Melly, challenge first. Uh, uh, hesitation. Yes, alas, yes. He got tongue tied, so it's hesitation. Uh, 41 seconds on power, Andre, starting now. This is something that men are particularly interested in, in public life and sometimes in private. Something that we women don't quite understand. Why is it necessary for them to wield power? Is there something else lacking? Uh, something? Clement Freud has challenged why. It was the third something. Yes, I guess, the, yes, third, the third something. I quite agree there was something before. 25 seconds for you, um, uh, um, Clement, on power starting now. It has three prongs as opposed to an electric light plug, which only has two. I don't really understand the deeper points of electricity, but I'm always told that if you have an electric fire, a cooker, possibly an ironing board which works off the main... Uh, Kenneth Williams, you'll challenge. Why? It's utterly boring. <laughs> It may be, but he wasn't deviating from power. No, I just wanted to get a knock. <laughs> well, I would be careful because everybody's very, very close at this stage in the game. I disagree with your challenge. He does gain a point and he has seven seconds to continue with power starting now. We once lived in a bungalow which was DC, but we then got alternative current in a house. <laughs> Well, um, uh, Clement Freud was speaking again when the whistle went. He got an extra point for Clement, uh, Kenneth's uh, um, challenge. So he now has a lead of one over Peter Jones at the end of that round. Kenneth and Andre are equal in third place, just a little way behind. So it's very, very exciting, and I think we're getting towards the end of the show. But we certainly have time for one more round. Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is happiness. Can you talk to us about that for 60 seconds, starting now? Well, I know it's something that you can't successfully find. You have to come across it when you're trying to do something else. In other words, it is a kind of byproduct of a task or even some effort that one is making in the course of one's normal life or abnormal, if it so uh, happens that it is uh, something that happens in that way. Um, <laughs> They were very kind, uh, but Clement yes, Freud couldn't let it go any longer. You challenged uh, Clement. Why? Repetition. Of what? Something. And something else, yes. Something. <laughs> Clement, you have a point for a correct challenge. 35 seconds on happiness starting now. One of the saddest things about happiness is that it can't buy money. But there are <laughs> other attributes which are equally distressing. For instance, it doesn't matter how happy one is, with Kenneth Williams sitting next to one, every now and again putting his left arm onto my left knee. <laughs> Andre Milley has challenged one. His left arm on his left knee. Mm. I had to do it for accuracy's sake. At 15 seconds for Andre Milley having gained another point on happiness starting now. The important thing in life is to know when you've got it and appreciate it to the full. So many of us miss the opportunity and only afterwards... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Why? Well, she says so many of us miss the opportunity. Now, who is she speaking for? <laughs> <laughs> you think it's devious because... Uh... Well, I don't want to be in that category. I don't feel you that think... I have missed these opportunities. <laughs> I mean, there haven't been very many, but believe me... <laughs> Taking them with both hands. <laughs> Other words, you, you think it is devious to say that so many people miss the opportunity. Well, you, of course, you think so, so many of us, she said, so many of us. So she means you as well, you know. <laughs> and old Freud there and Kenneth. Uh, so you, you think that the, the majority of people don't miss the opportunity? Well, certainly Absolutely they don't. If you no, were that, on that they basis, you have a correct challenge. Ah, though, thank you very much. So you have a point. And what's and you the have... subject? <laughs> 
Don't give yourself away, Peter. There are three seconds on happiness with you, Peter Jones, starting now. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Happiness is indeed a wonderful thing, and we enjoy it very much, and we find it here on Just a Minute. And there's a very happy moment today because the, well, I'll tell you the score in reverse order. Kenneth Williams was only just in fourth place. Andre Melly was only one point ahead in third place. Clement Freud was a few points ahead, but he was alongside our winner who has played the game less than anybody else, Peter Jones. Joint winners this week, Peter Jones and Clement Freud. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us on this particular edition of Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. <laughs>We present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Sheeta Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we are delighted to welcome back Sheila Hancock to do battle with these... to do battle with his three tough male exponents of the game and show that it isn't entirely a man's world. Uh, once again, I'm going to ask them all to speak, if they can, for just one minute on some unlikely subject that I will give them, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject which is written on the card in front of me. According to how well they do this, they will gain points, or their opponents will. And let us begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject that Ian Messer has chosen this week for you to start with is quince. Can you talk to us for 60 seconds on quince starting now? If you were to go into a chemist shop and request some talcum powder and the assistant came up from behind and made a remark <laughs> of doubtful tact, you might give a quince, which is a quick wince. But there is another definition of this word, which is a sort of fruit. Uh, Kenneth Williams' challenge. Why? Meditation. I agree with your challenge. So you gain a point for a correct challenge and you take over the subject of quince and there are 36 seconds left starting now. It was predicted before I was born, so I have been informed that my mother might have quince. And when she was told of this, apparently the alarm and despondency was appalling to behold. That is a word I myself have coined, and I think I should be given due credit, after all, where that kind of knowledge is due, and in terms of recognition. Um, Sheila Hancock has oh, challenged. Why? Rubbish. Deviation. I you mean, mean he got make... away from talking about Quincy, he was yes. now talking about the word that he'd coined. Yes. I quite agree that is devious, Sheila. Yes. So you gain a point for a correct challenge, and you you take over the subject with 10 seconds to go, starting now. This is the name of a fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream, and also... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged you. 
Why? Deviation. Why? He was not a fan. I quite agree. I, I got mixed up with peas got... blossom and the, and the yes. humans, didn't yes, I? Yes, because it was a... So, Go on then, um... Clement Freud. Get on with it. <laughs> Clement Freud has a point for a correct challenge, and he has six seconds on oh. quince starting now. If you take these fruit and boil them down, you make something called a quince cheese, which... <laughs> not know that whistle tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking at that particular moment gains an extra point on this occasion it was clement freud so at the end of that round he has a lead of one over everybody else <laughs> sheila hancock will you begin the second round oh sheila if i was sent to the moon oh meaning me or you <laughs> <laughs> you use yeah. that phrase oh. so it's obviously about you oh and you have 60 seconds and you start now I wouldn't like it at all. Judging by the photographs that we've had reflected back to us, it looks a very dreary place. Uh, Peter Jones' a challenge, why? Well, they haven't been reflected back to us. How they have, have they they're been... bounced off a satellite. Bounce, but not reflected. <laughs> same thing, No, same actually, thing. I think, uh, scientifically speaking, you're probably correct. They're not reflected. I don't know uh, whether... Can they be? Any scientists in the audience? Can they be reflected? Yes, they of can. course they can. I would... I will put it to the audience. I yes, look... well, I wanted to say something because during all that business about quinces, I didn't speak at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I'd better uh, get in, you know, otherwise people would think it was a three-handed game. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously you can have uh, uh, things that are reflected back from the moon as well as transmitted. So, Sheila, it's an incorrect challenge. You gain a point, therefore. Keep the subject and there are 52 seconds left starting now. It appears to be rather dusty and it's difficult to stand on your feet without floating away. Therefore, you have to wear rather unattractive shoes and I like wearing pretty ones. Also, I'm not frightfully keen on that great big suit you have to wear. I think can't... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged you again. Repetition of wear. All right, Peter, you have a correct challenge. You gain a point and the subject. 34 seconds. If I were sent to the moon starting now. Well, they would obviously have run out of astronauts if they uh, <laughs> sent me because I shouldn't really be equipped to make the journey. I'm not keen on going very far, even in this country, and to be actually catapulted or shot or exploded or rocketed to another planet fills me with awe. Now, I dare say it could be that I was being punished in some way and that it was the equivalent in the last century of sending people to a penal colony in Australia, Tasmania. <laughs> Jones kept going magnificently on something that he would not like to do, spoke for quite a long time, gained the extra point for speaking when the whistle went, and the end of that round, Peter, Sheila and Clement all have two points. Kenneth has one. It's neck and neck. <laughs> oh, we know whose side the audience are on this week. <laughs> right, Kenneth Williams, it's your turn to begin, and the subject we've got for you is the wind. <laughs> A lot Very of it's known, been known to pass your lips. <laughs> and, and, Kenneth, will you go on the wind for 60 seconds, <laughs> starting now? Well, of course, as the poet says, the sweet south that breathes upon a bank of violets. And this is probably one of the most beautiful evocations of wind. There is another version of the wind that blows the wind over the footprints so that none may track me to my hurt. Hang the night with stars so that I may walk abroad without stumbling and cleanse me with bitter herbs and make me whole. Zephyr is one of the words which describes... Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged you. Why? He said Zephyr before, didn't he? No, he didn't. I, I haven't know. discussed Zephyr. Oh, I thought you said school. it right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, then I've given oh, you, you a point. Oh, you are so charming, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> so quotes just... poetry and then turns around all ugly, doesn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. he quotes poetry, gets all the audience going with him, yeah. and they lose it all by saying, oh, you're a great fool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 20 <laughs> seconds left for you with the wind. Uh, yeah, um, what's your name? I'm sorry. Oh, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> Starting now. When it's blown through a very narrow aperture, people tend to refer to it as a draft. And, of course, this... Uh, uh, Clement Freud is talking to why? Repetition of, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. 
Oh, she... you're going to sit there and stand for that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sit there and stand for that. I like that expression. I remember that one. <laughs> he did say, of course, before, so... Uh, as its repetition, Clement gets a point and the subject. Ten seconds on the wind, Clement, starting now. That which comes from the east tends to blow more fiercely in this country than wind from the west. Uh, Kenneth Williams' challenge to why? To thens. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, I think he said that which comes from the east tends to blow more fiercely than than that which comes from the west. Oh, I misheard you. To that. No. Oh, to I that. I apologise. Well, to that. To one that. that. Oh, I meant that. I meant the two that. That's what I meant. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant. It's too late now. You said than. You said with great confidence. Well, I, well I meant repetition. It's for you to sort it out, mate. I know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what they do all the time. They just throw it in my lap and say, sort that one out. Uh, well, he got well, me for the course. And I know it was twice. accurate. Now, I, I get so many letters about this. I have to be fair and accurate. It's a very well listened and the audience are on your side, but you challenged on than and it was at that. So Clement continues with four seconds on the wind starting now. North wind howls down from Scotland <laughs> and Speaking then when the whistle went, he gains the extra point and increases his lead at the end of that round. Uh, Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject is confetti. Can you talk to us about confetti for 60 seconds starting now? It's delightful stuff. It's made of paper. It comes in... Uh, Kenneth Williams' has challenged. Three it's. <laughs> it's delightful stuff. It's made of paper. It comes. Yes. I thought I little heard. words you explained to me when I well, first we're not joined. Gonna, I'm not going to bother. Well, I'm we... being gone, of course. You're going to be gone, it may. <laughs> <laughs> and from now on, such little challenges, such trivial challenges as it's like that, I think we're going to ignore. We won't count any points for that and let Peter Jones continue with confetti with 55 seconds. No, no, Riley, no. no. <laughs> Starting... Well, you were saying, of course, so many times, I thought it was an impediment. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't challenge you. Starting... You won't even let me say it two or three times. You're just cashing on the fact that you've got an impediment. I've never heard of it. <laughs> You can't go on saying it forever, though, Peter. That's no, no, I won't going. say it forever. Oh, right. I hadn't got saying it forever in mind. <laughs> but if you've got confetti in mind, will you continue for 55 seconds, starting now? In many different colours. Yellow, orange, blue, green, red, white, never black. And it comes in a variety of shapes. Square, round, <laughs> triangular, <laughs> diamond-shaped, and sometimes in a form of crescents. Now, this is thrown on gala occasions and at carnivals, sometimes weddings. Not at my own, which took place in Reno, Nevada, because they didn't have any there at the time. Now, no doubt, many years later, they are selling wedding kits with... Uh, um, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of wedding. I'm afraid there was. You oh, said yes. wedding before. Yes, yes, well, I'm glad there hasn't been. But, um... <laughs> you can only have one wedding, Peter, so there we are. Uh, Clement had a correct challenge. He gains a point. 17 seconds on confetti. Clement, starting now. Con is Italian for with, and fetti is a small kind of pasta, not unlike spaghetti, macaroni, lasagna, or fettuccine, for which the word is actually an abbreviation. <laughs> but at my own wedding, which was not held uh, in Reno... Peter Jones' challenge, why? A repetition of word. Yes. Uh, the word, that's right. <laughs> he said word, word at the beginning and then he just yes. said word. Yes, on the sign and so forth. Right, Peter, one second. Well got in just before you up to beat Clement Freud at his uh, usual game. One second on confetti starting now. Rainbow Hue. <laughs> Jones was then speaking when the whistle went. He gained the extra point. He's now two points behind our lead at the end of that round, who is still Clement Freud. <laughs> Clement, your turn to begin again. The subject is the book I plan to write. And once again, I remind you, you take the phrase and you use it. The book I plan to write, 60 seconds, starting now. The book I plan to write will be a slim volume containing a number of words which Peter Jones would obviously think are repeated from previous pages. <laughs> but the book that I shall write will be original, scintillating, and, 
as I think I might have mentioned before, of limited wordage or verbiage. It will contain poems and prose, an anthology of verse such as I love, and a mixture of different kinds of approaches to the literary scene, as one might... <laughs> Peter Jones is challenged by it. Hesitation. I think it was more of a dry up, actually. <laughs> His book had come to a halt in the middle somewhere. Uh, Peter, hesitation is correct. You have a point, and you have a 23 seconds for the book I plan to write starting now. I shall write one chapter at least about what a wonderful chairman you are and how you adjudicated this game through thick and thin, in fair weather and in foul, sometimes kindly, sometimes not so uh, gentle. Clement Freud's challenge, why? Repetition. Of what? Sometimes. Sometimes kindly, sometimes yes, correct. Clement, you have another point, and there are eight seconds for the book I plan to write starting now. My publishers would like this to be covered in purple binding, but I personally insist on heliotrope or mo. <laughs> trope or mauve binding on the book of that anthology. Uh, at the end of that round, Clement, you read Peter Jones by three and the other two by more than some what? Uh, no, they're only just a little way behind Peter in third and fourth place. Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin. The subject, innocence. It's not an easy one, is it, really? But anyway, would you talk to us about it, if you can, for 60 seconds, starting now? It's something about which I know a lot, because I spend my whole time believing the best of things and people and discovering the worst. This... Uh, Kenneth Williams' challenge, why? In deviation. She's mixing up trust with innocence. No. If you're believing the best of people, then you're trusting them, which has nothing to do with innocence. Innocence doesn't even take whether you should trust them or not into consideration. If they turn out to be wrong, then you've been innocent in thinking that they're right. A newborn babe is totally innocent and he never thinks anyone's going to do him, does he? Exactly. Well, you're not a newborn babe. Look at the size of you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think, I think Kenneth has a, a very good point. Of course, I, think, I have a very good point. I think you can be... Oh, shut up. Kenneth, you have a point. And the subject, 51 seconds for Innocence starting now. It is appropriate that I should discuss this subject because, indeed, it is something which only occurs with the child. Once we see through the glass darkly... Uh, Sheila Hancock, a challenge. Deviation. Why is it indeed appropriate that he should discuss it if it's only with the child. In because I know words, about kids, that's why. Oh, rubbish! She's In pregnant. other words, you mean it is a fallacy to say that a child is innocent, a child... No! No, it's a people. fallacy that... I am be... a child at heart! You see, this is the whole point. I'm an undeveloped thing. Well, I want to know I'm embryonic, she... you see. Yes. I'm undeveloped, yes. you see. I'm undeveloped. I'll give yes. you that. I'll give yes, you that. Point. You yes. can have the point. Yes. You have the point. <laughs> You're the most undeveloped but thing. What they will do to gain points from this kid? Publicly admit they're undeveloped and he gets a point. So, 37 seconds on underdeveloped... I mean, I'm sorry, um... <laughs> 37 seconds on Innocence, uh, Kenneth, starting now. And when you see them in those perambulators with those pink cheeks and lovely eyes, looking unblinkingly, knowing there is no such thing as crime, negligence, ill usage, malignity, no... Uh, Sheila, I challenge you again. I dispute that all children in prams know that there's no such thing as ill usage. <laughs> <laughs> she can't even say it! I, I, no! I, I ill-used Ellie Jane a lot because I never knew how to put a nappy on and she got stuck with pins a lot. So, I mean, she knew that you could be ill-used. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and a child's innocence is a, and very much an adult way of looking at things and emotionally they're not as innocent as that. Exactly. She, that, you you took the words point. out of my mouth. Would you like to finish? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't enough innocence. Uh, Sheila, you have 20 seconds with a point gained, of course, to continue on innocence starting now. It is very difficult to go through life being innocent because the more experience you gain, the less you have of it. And life is a... Um, um, Peter yeah. Jones a challenge. Why? Repetition of life. Yes. Yes, we've had more well, than one life. Well, it does go on. So, once it? again, Peter gets in <laughs> just before the whistle. Three seconds to go. Oh. Innocence, Peter, starting now. It's so long since I experienced this quality. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, everybody gained points in that round except Clement Freud. Peter Jones, speaking with the whistle, went gained the extra one. So he's now only one point behind our leader, who is still Clement. But Sheila and Kenneth are both creeping up on them. Kenneth, the subject for you now is something which we love to hear you talk about. Something historical. Nero. Would you like to tell us something about Nero in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, he was a very beautiful, red-headed youth, and as an attorney, we are told that in the Senate he won the case for Rhodes taxation, and they were so pleased they put his head on all the coins. Later, very much like Henry VIII, he became an appalling monstrosity, and used his position with appalling and callous... And Clement has challenged you. Repetition. Of appalling. appalling, yes. He might have been appalling, but you can't say it twice when you talk about him in this game, alas, Kenneth. So Clement has a point and the subject. 37 seconds, Nero starting now. Nero comes to our attention particularly for fiddling while Rome burnt. But we are never told on what gas mark, at what setting of electricity, or how else the capital city of Gaul, as it then was, and Italy now. No, yes, you're right. You gave yourself There's a, a verb missing there somewhere. Yes. Yes. Well, it certainly wasn't yeah. Gaul. Yeah, it certainly wasn't Gaul. I thought no. you paused because you made a mistake. Gaul you made a mistake. France. It wasn't among Gaul, other, among other things. No, yes. Gaul is now present-day France. That you got is... hopelessly mixed up. You didn't no. buy your what's it, though, You didn't buy it. You were silly beside him. Well, didn't well I didn't want to because, you see, I am by nature modest. <laughs> and when somebody's underway, I always believe, Nick, in giving them a chance. After all, isn't that what we're here for? To try and share and share. 50-50. Don't you... Don't you think exactly. also, Kenneth, you were a bit upset because you were going so beautifully on Nero, you were really offended that your friend should have interrupted you before. <laughs> yes, it was a hurt appalling thing to do. Appalling. I thought an ungallant. Well, don't let your hurt show so much. Get back in the game because you knew Gaul was France. But Peter got him on hesitation, as Clement knew it was. That's why he hesitated. 18 seconds, Nero, Peter starting now. As any keen race girl will tell you, Nero was a three-year-old in 1947 <laughs> and was second in the Cambridgeshire Handicap. Cap. Later, he raced at Newmarket and Chelmsford and was... <laughs> Clement Floyd is challenged. Deviation. Why? No race course at Chelmsford. <laughs> <laughs> there might be, but Nero didn't race there anyway, we did. So, Clement, I agree with your challenge. You have three seconds on Nero starting now. Fiddle, hey, diddle, Freud was speaking then when the whistle went and he's managed to increase his lead over all the others at the end of that round. Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject, nonsense. Something which is used and spoken about a great deal in this show, but can you talk to us about it for 60 seconds starting now? I've never been too keen on it, even when it's been written by experts. Say, for instance, it's ten past six, I'd better try and talk some of it. I hope you'll excuse me. It's a three-tiered theatre with a lot of dim faces. The lights aren't too good. One topless waitress in gold holding um, up the box Kenneth there. Kenneth Williams has challenged. Because he's not discussing nonsense. He's Isn't giving us factual observation. I think Peter was giving an ex-demonstration of nonsense. I'm with him on this one. He has a point, And the subject he keeps, 40 seconds left, starting now. Alice in Wonderland was another example of it. Alice and the... Um, um, Clement Freud got in first, then. Repetition of uh, Alice. Of Alice, alas, yes. So, Clement, you gain the point. 36 seconds on nonsense, starting now. Arthur Askey, Jimmy Wheeler and Nicholas Parsons are as unlikely a trio of serious actors as I have ever seen in Midsummer Night's Dream at Her Majesty's Theatre on a Tuesday afternoon when, as most people know, there is no matinee. <laughs> and yet the box office declining to sell me tickets for a performance which did not take place announced over the loudspeaker silently to people who are not listening, that one way or another, a rhomboid, a parallelogram. A fine example of nonsense. Clement Freud went on very well, and he's gained more points because he was also speaking when the whistle went at the end of that round. Sheila, your turn to begin. The subject, umbrage. Can you talk to us about umbrage for 60 seconds, starting now? 
This is something I am trying not to take because you allowed Kenneth's challenge about my definition of innocence. I am not going to sulk and hide my head and experience umbrage because I feel it is a despicable way to carry on and makes not for progress. However, a lot of children are inclined to do this when they feel sulky and I say to them, life is too short to feel like that, my darling. Do not feel angry. Kenneth, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, what a relief. Well, I, I, I was bored. Yes, so was I. You were bored because oh, she said so feel I. twice. Oh, that's right, was I yes. in? Yes, yes. <laughs> that's right. Well, she paused herself because she knew she'd said it twice, so there we are. Kenneth, she did indeed say feel twice, so you have a point, and you have uh, 27 seconds for the subject of Umbridge starting now. This is something which is taken by people who genuinely feel they have been very badly treated. Now, I think it's done with justification. I mean, after all, there are occasions in this world where people do say very rude things, and I think, uh, uh, Jean Jones all, challenged you. Why? <laughs> repetition of people. Yes, there are quite a lot of people on that uh, particular... Uh, you got so carried away with your impersonation there. We, we didn't know what you were doing. You were loving every moment of it, weren't you? So, um, people gains uh, Peter Jones a point and 16 seconds for Umbridge Peter starting now. Sometimes people leap up and walk out of rooms and it is described as having taken Umbridge. I haven't myself ever experienced this in person, though I have, as I say, heard of other... Well, Peter Jones was then speaking when the whistle went and he gained the extra point and increased the position that he had. And I'm afraid I have to tell you we have no more time in this particular edition of Just a Minute. So it remains for me to give you the final score. Kenneth did come up from a rather bad fourth in that round to a poor fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila finished um, a weak third. <laughs> Peter Jones came with a flourish at the end into a very strong second position. He did very well. He had 12 points, but he was one point, only one point behind this week's winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> Do hope that you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute from all of us here. Goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by Simon Brett. We present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again we have our four most experienced players of the game and I'm going to ask them all in turn of course to speak if they can for just one minute on some unlikely subject without hesitation, without repetition and without deviation from the subject which is written on the card in front of me. And according to how well they do this they will gain points or their opponents will. And let us begin the show this week with Peter Jones. Peter, the subject very apt for this program, noise. Can you talk to us about noise for 60 seconds, starting now? 
Now, that's an example of noise. <laughs> the level of noise is increasing up and down the country. I put it down to aeroplanes, largely, and other things like... Uh, Keith Williams has challenged you. Up and down the country, I put it down. Repetition. Up and down, I put it down, do we? Yes. Oh, yes. I thought he was going to give you a repetition of the raspberry at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge, so you gain a point for a correct challenge and you take over the subject and there are 45 seconds left for noise starting now. Well, of course, we would need to define this semantically because what some people is noise is to others something very, very pleasant. And I've repeated myself, and so I'm And uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged you. Repetition. Sheila, I agree with your challenge, and you take over the subject of noise, and there are 33 seconds left, starting now. This is something I cannot abide. The modern trend towards having transistors on the whole time, blaring out pop music, to me, is absolutely appalling. I cherish being able to sit in silence. However, apparently, I remember learning at school that the only place where you can and get total silence in the world. Uh, and Clement now, you'll, never know. Sure. you'll never know now. <laughs> what was the challenge? Uh, challenge, Clem. Repetition of silence. Of silence, yes. You were going on about your total silence and we'll never know. But uh, Clement Freud, I agree with the correct challenge. You gain a point and you have 13 seconds for noise starting now. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee. I always thought the recluse who decided to go to Innisfree must have had a very noisy life with those insects. of you who may not know, the whistle tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains the extra point. On this occasion it was Clement Freud, so at the end of the first round, once again, Clement Freud has a lead of one over everybody else. Uh, Clement, it's your turn to begin and the subject for you is fruit cup. Can you talk to us about fruit cup for 60 seconds starting now? One of the most significant things about hibernating hedgehogs is their total <laughs> abstention from fruit cup. Never do animals... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged Hesitation. No, I don't think he hesitated. When well, he, he slowed hesitated? up for a while. <laughs> yeah, because he thought... I mean, I speeded up a bit earlier. <laughs> he was terrified when he went on about a hedgehogs and fruit cup that you were going to challenge him. Uh, so, anyway, no, I disagree with the challenge. It wasn't a hesitation. Clement, mm. therefore, has a point for an incorrect challenge. He keeps the subject, fruit cup, 50 seconds left, starting now. Tortoises in the summer month, however, adore fruit cup. Mint, borage, apple, banana, pear... <laughs> Grapefruit, damson. Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged what? Deviation, because I don't think you can generalise about tortoises. My next door neighbour's tortoise doesn't like fruit cup. <laughs> so, I mean, he can't. Yes, generalize. if he can, uh, yes. But he was saying that all tortoises like fruit yeah. cup, wasn't he? And he can't prove that point. No. And you, you can make out a very good case for saying that tortoise doesn't like yeah. it. So, I think that's a good challenge, Sheila. So, so do I think I. you deserve a point for it. <laughs> so, you take over, and the audience, some one person, the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Four Sheila's tortoise-owning neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> there are 34 seconds for fruit cup, Sheila, starting now. You take a bottle of fizzy lemonade and a fairly good sauterne and a dash of brandy, put in some mint and bits of orange and lemon and some sugar, mix it all together, put it in a pretty punch bowl and ladle it out into attractive glasses. There can be nothing more pleasant on a hot summer's evening or even a cold winter's night. If it's winter... Peter yeah. <laughs> Jones got in first for the challenge. Uh, repetition of winter. I agree with your challenge of the repetition, and you have seven seconds for fruit cup starting now. Soda water is a very important ingredient if you're trying to economise. The ordinary variety will do, but... was speaking then when the whistle went. At the end of that round, Peter has two points, and so is Sheila. Kenneth has one, but Clement's in the lead with three. Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin. The subject, finding a caterpillar in the salad. 
I don't know whether it's happened to you, it's happened to many people, but would you talk about it for 60 seconds starting now? Well, actually, this reminds me of an absolutely traumatic experience in my childhood. I had school dinners, and one day I really did find a caterpillar in my salad. And being a very shy child, I hardly dared mention it. And I nibbled a bit of it, trying to disguise the fact that it was there, but it made me feel so sick that eventually I did attract the attention of my teacher and say, there is a caterpillar in my salad. Whereupon she didn't believe me and said, you will stay there until you have finished that salad. And I honestly had to sit there for the entire lunch hour and eat the salad, caterpillar and all. <laughs> However, I do believe that things have improved since and I'm sure that children don't get caterpillars in their salad anymore. I always take the precaution of washing each lettuce leaf separately and I put salt on to kill any <laughs> that was such a pathetic story. It's Nobody true. The... It's absolutely true. I know, but you were getting a bit taut at the end, keeping going. Know. Nobody wanted to challenge you, Sheila, because they had such sympathy for this <laughs> childhood experience that you had. And of course, when you start with the subject and finish with it, as Sheila did then, and nobody has done that for some considerable time in just a minute, she gains two points for doing that. And so Sheila has now got the lead at the end of that round. Well done. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. Louis Lumiere. Do you know something about him? And can you talk to us about him for 60 seconds, starting now? Well, I believe he, with his brother Auguste Lumiere, did start in public showing moving pictures. They were revolutionary at the time and could be fairly said to be the precursors of the modern cinema, where the people come up out of the floor playing the organ, all lit up so beautifully. Oh, how romantic that idea is coming out of the floor playing an organ. Yeah, <laughs> has challenged you. He came out of the floor too often. Yes, he did. <laughs> once. Only too come often. out once is enough. <laughs> uh, there are 32 seconds left for Louis Lumiere. You have the subject, Clement, starting now. Louis Lumiere's second son was one who. <laughs> Kenneth Williams got his first answer. Hesitation, yes, Kenneth. Now you have Louis Lumiere, and there are 24 seconds left on Louis Lumiere starting now. Well, he said to his wife, you know, how do you think I'm going to do this? And she said, well, obviously by doing an image twice and then shoving it through a reel and have a little bit of difference in one drawing to the other. And therefore they were seen, when you show them very quickly on this cylinder, as though the whole thing is moving. <laughs> Louis Lumiere got some points for Kenneth Williams. Peter Jones, your turn to begin. And the subject is attracting attention, something we all do in this game at different times. Will you talk about it for just one minute, starting now? Because everybody here in this country is so well-mannered and polite and dull, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do it because they ignore you. If you are lying um, Kenneth drunk... Kenneth Williams has challenged to Yes, because twice. <laughs> because everyone in this country, and then because oh, they ignore you. Mm. Kenneth, you gain a point for the correct challenge, and you have 47 seconds for yes. attracting attention. Oh, dear. <laughs> Attract attention in 47 seconds, Kenneth, starting now. Well, you can do this in various ways. I mean, some people do it by setting themselves a light. Other people do it by shutting the odds, and other people get up, and I've said other people three times. Isn't yes. that ludicrous? Peter <laughs> Jones has challenged you. Incoherence. <laughs> Well, actually... Uh, he uh, sounded as though he'd been switched on at the wrong speed. <laughs> but he was certainly attracting attention, wasn't he? Well, yes, he was, yes. But he very sportingly gave away, as you were quite incoherent, what he said was, uh, and he said he did repeat himself. So, Peter, you have the subject. One point more to you. 41 seconds left, starting now. Lying drunk on the pavement. People step over you. They try to um, avoid... Ken Williams' challenge, why? Well, he's not discussing attracting attention. Well, if someone's lying drunk on the pavement, I think they're attracting a great deal of attention. No, he's just said people step over them, dear. Weren't you listening? They step over them. They can't be trying to get any attention, can they? They're very cool. Yes, they go round them. Pete! Ken, all I can say is if they weren't attracting attention, they would step on them. 
I'm attracting sa- attention. I'm having people walk over you. How quite difficult it is to attract attention. I'm all with you on this one, Peter. Oh, yes, thank I you very much. You That's very nice. Uh, Thirty-six seconds. You're doing an awfully good job, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see how fickle they are with their uh, feelings towards the chairman. Right, thirty-six seconds for attracting attention, Peter. Starting now. When they were first driving motor cars, they had a man in front walking on foot, a pedestrian, carrying a red flag in um, order... Kenneth Williams has challenged you again. No, it's not her. It's not true. It's her. It's deviation. That it was, was done with true. railway trains. It wasn't done with cars. It was done with motor cars. On the contrary, it was never. There is no historical accuracy in that statement whatsoever. Well, I prepare to back my opinion on that one and say that Peter Jones has another point. Peter... You have 27 seconds for attracting attention starting now. On the stage, it's rather easier to do it because you have the benefit of the lights. And other actors sometimes assist by looking upstage to where one is, if one is able to get uh, there. Kenneth Williams, a challenge. Two one. <laughs> there were two one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you this time, Kenneth. You have a correct challenge and 14 seconds for attracting attention starting now. Well, Amelia Bloomer did it outside Buckingham Palace by removing her crinoline and the public cry, what ho, when she walked around in drawers. And that, of course, did draw, as you might say, quite a lot of attention. Right, well, you certainly attracted attention to yourself there, Kenneth, and you have gained some points trying very hard all throughout, and at the end of that round, you have leapt into the lead. Oh, quite right. It's a disgrace. I wasn't there before. That's a disgrace. I haven't got much cheap and I've been there already. You usually get more excited about it. But anyway, you have a yeah. lead of one over all the others, and they're all equal Quite in second right. place at the moment. Only justice seems to seem to be done. Quite right. <laughs> Clem and Freud, it's your turn to begin. The subject is life savers. Can you talk to us about them for 60 seconds, starting now? Soon after I had finished reading a book entitled How to Remain Sexually Uninvolved Administering the Kiss of Life, <laughs> I received my badge as a lifesaver on the beaches of Lowestoft and neighbouring sands. The inspector for East Anglia came along and pinned the lifesaver's badge on my left breast, which caused a nasty inflammation. Uh, whereupon... Peter Jones's challenge on your left breast. What was it? <laughs> well, it was a repetition of the life-saving badge. No, you see, the word is, uh, the subject is lifesavers, and we have established people... Well, he mentioned the badge twice, didn't he? No, no, the lifesavers badge, he he, uh, mentioned only once, the badge. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. Um, (laughs) We thought it was the breast you were were fascinated with. Anyway, um, uh, it's an incorrect challenge, so Clement Freud gains a point. He keeps the subject 60 seconds left, sorry, 30 seconds left, (laughs) starting now. Having qualified, I was able to grow tall and bronzed, and pick up a better class of woman than I would otherwise have achieved had I remained a puny, pale, non-swimming specimen. Uh, of Sheila who... Hancock has challenged. Why? Deviation. I don't think that's necessarily true because a better class of women usually like puny little. <laughs> 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 I think it is obvious, Sheila, that the audience is on your side, and there's obviously some better class of women who do like these puny sort of people. And you've got a very good point, and the only fair thing I can do is give you a point, and the subject, of course, 14 seconds for lifesavers starting now. However, being rather common myself, I do prefer the large, brawny lifesavers that you see on the beaches in Spain. I don't, however, particularly like the fact... The Clement Freud has challenged one. Repetition of however. Yes. Being however, yes. I Being don't however, know. yes. Tough but accurate. So you have four seconds, Clement, for lifesavers starting now. Help me save my flesh, shout. <laughs> Save your flesh. How subtle can you get? Well, he meant after the had lacerated his breast. <laughs> How do we become a lifesaver without getting uh, kiss, kiss of life? Uh, the kiss of life, uh, your bronze left breast and your lifesaver's flesh and all the rest gave you a very definite lead at the end of that round, Clement Freud. <laughs> Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin, and the subject is independence. Can you talk to us about that subject for 60 seconds starting now? This is something I would advocate everybody developing because ultimately I believe we are all totally alone. It starts from the minute when you start 
No, and no one's challenged you. I too stand up. Uh, Kate, <laughs> you mustn't commit yourself out of your own mouth. Peter Jones challenged. Yes, I did reluctantly because I wanted to hear what she was going to say. <laughs> yeah. uh, we all did, but you challenged. And well, started. yes, because I thought she was uh, probably expecting it, and I never like to disappoint ladies. Peter, why did you challenge? <laughs> what? Why did you challenge? Because she uh, said start twice. Repetition. Repetition of start, yes. Oh, I thought it was for hesitation. All right, start. So, Peter, you have a correct challenge, and you have 47 seconds for independence starting now. It's something that we should encourage our children to try to acquire, and if we are able to present them with a philosophy which will assist them at whatever age they find themselves when the moment comes to leave the parental home, then they will oh, be... The Kenneth Williams, why have you challenged? Well, I mean, it was all so full of stops and alts and flows. Yes, it's all a load of rubbish. I mean, he was just hesitating all the time, really. He just got it slow, slow down. That it, it was a bit dreary, wasn't it? was yeah. going to go on like that all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> Kenneth... For that lively challenge, we give you a point and 25 seconds to continue with independence starting now. Independence was achieved, of course, at the Boston Tea Party by these colonial people who broke away from us and defied George, the rightful king, and thus made themselves into the United States of America. Now the Americans, of course, do inherit... Uh, came in for a challenge, you why? Uh, the usual challenge, of course. <laughs> oh, you wicked thing, you. <laughs> Every week he has no course, and there there was this great romance that's flourished throughout just a minute between these two sitting by, and he's now slowly killing it. Of course, there's a correct challenge. You gain a point, Clement, and you have seven seconds for independence starting now. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Clever Kenneth Williams is challenging. His name is Jefferson, says so deviation. I didn't mean Jefferson. You did, I can you see did, by you your face. You did, you thought that was very important. Of course. Because you took and it out from the Boston Tea Party. Yes. Yes. You're quite right. You were in America <laughs> mentally. Uh, I agree with your challenge, um, <laughs> Kenneth. You have a point. Five seconds for independence starting now. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was what he advocated. And how beautiful those things would sound. <laughs> Kenneth was then speaking when the whistle went, so at the end of that round, he's gone back into the lead, and this time alongside Clement Freud. And it's a very close contest, because Peter Jones is only three points behind, and Sheila's only four points behind the two of them. And, Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. Oh, thank goodness for that. I can't get, I can't, I can't get me or in this week at all. <laughs> We've had plenty of all. No, 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 I've not enough. I don't feel I've fulfilled myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has a wonderful subject. What is it? Shoot for, for you to fulfill Yeah, go on. Get it out, hurry up. <laughs> I keep on about this expression of getting things out. I wish well, you get on with it. I'm more for modernity. My vibrations. Ah. <laughs> My vibrations. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant yours were going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the subject, is it? Yes, that's the oh, subject. Oh, my vibration. Oh, yes. I Have see. a little think about it. Now, go yes. on it. Well, when you hold Wait a minute, just on. a second. Oh. <laughs> He's keen, good. Right, 60 seconds starting now. I was taken by this medical examining board into this room and told to hold these electrodes, and they said, watch this diagram, and it will flicker according to the impulses that vibrate from your body. And we can determine from this what your appetites are in every single respect. And I said, yeah, do you mean eating? And they said, more than that, mate. We can tell what you'd be like on the job. I said, good gracious, do you mean in combat? They said, exactly, what other kind of job do you think the army... Oh, I've said it right. Sheila Hancock challenged yes, you. Yes, she would. <laughs> right. Repetition of job. I agree with your challenge, and you have my vibrations, and you have 23 seconds left for it starting now. They vary according to my mood. If I'm feeling terse, they turn people off. However, if I'm feeling happy and gay, I draw people towards <laughs> my uh, Peter Jones has challenged you what? <laughs> Repetition of people. Yes. Yes, and also she said feeling They were different twice, people, though. Which everybody missed. <laughs> um, there were different people, but you still repeated it, Sheila, so Peter has a point, and there are 12 seconds for my vibrations, Peter, starting now. You can buy electric machines for... Um, Kenneth Williams has Repetition, challenge. I've already discussed it. Yes, but Peter Jones has not said electric machines. Well, it's the same thing. In the same round, the same thing's discussed, so that goes to me, back to me. You I get a point. No, no, no. <laughs> Yours was a testing your... machine. 
You, and you want to finish your story, do you? Have you got something delicious to tell us? Oh, I could go into a lot of other stories. Oh, well, no, no. No, it wasn't a correct challenge because Peter Jones had not used any of those words, expressions, in this particular round, so he has a point for an incorrect challenge. Seven seconds for my vibrations, Peter, starting now. And it has a vibrating head with little rubber fingers on it. It's the no, best it's... cure for dandruff apart from decapitation <laughs> that you could possibly have. Also, I'll stimulate it. This is about the keenest contest we've had for quite some time because Sheila is in fourth place with seven points, but she's only two points behind our three equal leaders, Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams. So what about that? <laughs> Peter Jones, you're in good form and it's your turn to begin and the subject is pets. So can you talk to us on pets for 60 seconds starting now? We have several at our home. <laughs> Two cats, one black and one tabby, a tadpole, I hope it's still survived, it did this morning, was alive, was given a small piece of meat just before I left, and a terrapin, as well as several live worms. They are for fishing purposes and will no doubt meet their doom at the weekend when they are taken down to Richmond or Kingston and thrown into the Thames at the end of a line with a hook through their uh, guts. Sheila Hancock has challenged. I, well, don't, I don't think you can call those pets. I quite agree, Sheila. I wonder when someone's going to challenge. Those yes. are bait. No, I think if something's a pet, the true meaning of a pet is something that you love and nurture and you don't throw it to the fish. True. So, Sheila, I'm with you on this one. You have a correct challenge. You have another point and 25 seconds for pets starting now. I've got two horrible cats. Cats. One is called Tarquin and the other Peep. The first one is quite attractive, but the second one is an unmarried mother. Um, Clement Freud is challenged. Deviation. Why? They're horrible, they can't be attractive. I mean, it does seem... Oh, that's true. Oh, they can attract in a horrific sense. Yes. Oh, that's true. That's, that's really true. Dumb. That's true. And cats, this feline quality they have... Yeah, you ought to be annoying. So she <laughs> has a... <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Sheila has another point, and at this particular moment, they are all equal, by the way. And Sheila, you have 14 seconds for pets starting now. It conned us into letting it in, whereupon it went up uh, to my... Kenneth little... Williams has challenged. Why? I don't understand the language. <laughs> well, you've got to be very careful when you challenge at this stage of the game. And no, I am being very careful. I mean, uh, what, is, what is the English of condus? What is condus mean? Condus. <laughs> condus. A con man cons. A con man cons. And this a... particular cat is oh, a you're... con cat. <laughs> Are you, in, are you saying that cats play contrast tricks no. all no. the time? I do agree that uh, can, cats can con. If, uh, and obviously, uh, if you're talking in just a minute with a pressure of three people trying to challenge you, you must use very colloquial phrases on occasions, which is exactly what Sheila did. So it was an incorrect challenge. Sheila has another point. And ten and a half seconds for pets, Sheila, starting now. Having tricked its way in, it went up to my little girl's toy cupboard and had five kittens. So we then had seven. It was an alarming prospect because... Uh, Kenneth and his wife were challenged. She said, we had seven. Did she have seven kittens? <laughs> We had seven pets. No, she had seven. She could have said seven pets, but I was quite clear that she had got, got mm. seven. And so was, so, was yeah. so was I. So was I. And it was a very touching little story. Yes. And I think you're doing very well. And there is only one second left for pets with you, Sheila Hancock, starting now. Sheba and. Well, for those of you who have been feeling the tension in the audience, I have to tell you that we have no time to play any more, just a minute, so I have to read you out the final result. You probably guessed it, because Sheila Hancock, in spite of tremendous pressures, particularly from Kenneth Williams and all the other men, the three male competitors in this game came equal in second place with nine points, but they were this week beaten by our only lady competitor, Sheila Hancock, with 12 points. <laughs> I hope that you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute from all of us here. Goodbye. <laughs>
We present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Sheena Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again I'm going to ask our four competitors to speak, if they can, for just one minute on some unlikely subject without hesitation, without repetition and without deviating from the subject on the card in front of me. And according to how well they do this, they will gain points or their opponents will gain points. And that's how we play. And let's begin the show this week with Kenneth Williams. Well, that's gone down well with the audience. Kenneth, the subject that Ian Messer has thought of is my life so far. Can you talk to us about my life so far, starting now? To be strictly factual, it has reached its 45th year, and I have been blessed with great wisdom. I suppose this has been due to my development and the wise guidance of those counsellors who have come to my aid on so many occasions. Some joyously happy and some dreadfully sad moments in my life. And, of course, it has been developed largely because of the day when I saw stood on the stage and gave this incredible audition. They said, who'd you do? And I said, Mabel Constant Duro's in a bush hat. They said, that's <laughs> marvellous, give us an idea. And I said, well, I'll come and shot a bit bush hat. And they said, what are we going to do? Clement one? Freud has challenged you. <laughs> I didn't know how many bush hats he was wearing. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly were having more than one bush hat. Yes. Your bush hat came in twice. So uh, that was a correct challenge for repetition of Bush and uh, Clement Freud therefore takes over the subject having gained a point and there are 18 seconds left, Clement, my life so far starting now. When I went into this soft furnishing shop to ask for a Chesterfield, the man suggested a divan and I said, no, the one over there and he said, that is a sofa which will last you for a very long time. My life, uh, Sheila I? Hancock has challenged you. Deviation, do you buy Chesterfields in soft? furnishing uh, shops. Oh. I thought you bought materials and curtains and yeah. cushions. Yes. Yes, oh, exactly. I think yes. it is possible. I mean, after all, you do find some strange things in all kinds of different shops, but I think it's possible to find a Chesterfield. I would have called it a furniture shop where you bought a Chesterfield, not a soft, it might be a hard Yes, I'm afraid she is right. I'm afraid she's absolutely <laughs> right. <No. laughs> yes, well, all right. Up chairs and because they were but named but after they Lord Chesterfield. Energy, who was they? very hard. No, molecular energy, don't we? Are you all finished? I would have thought that a Chesterfield was a very soft piece of furnishing, even... Uh, no, we're not concerned. I've got a very hard thought. Chesterfield. What's fact? But, all right, when there is a disagreement amongst the four members of the panel like this, no. the four contestants, I do the only thing possible. I vow to the, uh, bow to the superior intelligence and wisdom of our delightful audience and say, will you be the final judges? You're and crawling. You're not bowing at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will crawl to our delightful audience. If you agree with Rubble. Sheila's challenge, will you cheer? And if you disagree, will you boo? And will you all do it together now? I think the hoorays had it just. Yes, they all had just, it. Just, just, right. just had it, yes. Sheila, you got in with only four seconds ago, which was very clever. You have a point for a correct challenge, and you have my life so far starting now. It has been a preparation for what is to come. I have gained experience. <laughs> whistle which is so elegantly blown for us by Ian Messiter tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking at that particular moment gains an extra point and on this occasion it was Sheila Hancock so she has a lead of one at the end of the first round. Peter Jones will you begin the second round? Yes certainly I oh, will. I'm, good. I'm glad you <laughs> I'm glad you. Right uh, oh Peter what a delightful subject for you. Unblocking the drain. <laughs> Can you talk to us about unblocking the drain for 60 seconds starting now? Well, Ian Messiter obviously chose this subject with the idea of bringing down the level of the game from the pinnacles of Kenneth Williams' oratory, the beautiful uh, white ivory towers, down into some area of the sub-basement where the drains are situated. I'm going to treat this subject metaphorically. Let us think of it rather as a clearing of the way a renewing of ourselves, ready for that great moment which must come to us all when the... <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm afraid, was a hesitation. You have a correct challenge, you have a point, Kenneth, and you have 22 seconds for unblocking the drain starting now. I have done this frequently. You take hold of this soda... Uh, Peter Jones and challenge why? Repetition. He said he'd done it frequently. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Peter. All right, so we give Peter Jones a point for... I a, wouldn't, a... it's a rotten joke. <laughs> I never said for a joke, I was going to say for a clever challenge, but as you didn't actually deviate uh, from the subject on the card, and it's not repetition of any word, we don't give it against you, uh, uh, Kenneth. You keep the subject, and you have 18 seconds left starting now. And you pour down the boiling water with a combination of this caustic soda. The result is a kind of explosion. I rush out the room in fear and trembling, because the stink is appalling, as all these terrible maggots and awful germs are all down there lurking like mad. They're lurking round the you know. <laughs> Well, Kenneth Williams was... I'm un- equal with her. Go on, tell me I'm equal with her. <laughs> I was about to say that Kenneth Williams was unblocking the drains when the whistle went, so he gained some points. He is equal with Sheila Hancock. Oh. And for once, Clement <laughs> Floyd's in last place. Oh, you're in last place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> but there's only one point between all of you. Um, Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject, seeing a friend off at a railway station. Can you talk to us about that for 60 seconds, starting now? Seeing a friend off at a railway station is a particularly good subject about which to talk because it is long, seeing a friend off at a railway station. (laughs) And you have to find out very carefully which railway station. It could be Marylebone, King's Cross, (laughs) Liverpool Street, possibly even Baker, or... (laughs) (laughs) Peter Jones, yes. Hesitation. Yes, indeed, yes. He he, he got this lovely idea of going through all the stations. He suddenly realised that some of them also had the word street in them more than... (laughs) So, Peter, a correct challenge, a point to you. 32 seconds for seeing a friend off at a railway station starting now. It's a... The title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, challenge you there. Hesitation. Yes, I'm afraid that was a hesitation, <laughs> Peter. Lemon <laughs> has <laughs> Why do you laugh at other people's misfortunes? Well, because he was some... crowing having got in, and then he went and made a mistake himself. <laughs> you all laugh when crowing? you get it. Yeah. He's oh, never I'm been known to crow. Oh, I have yeah. never crowed. <laughs> Crow and not get it. <laughs> Clement Freud has the subject under 31 seconds for seeing a friend off at a railway station starting now. Seeing a friend off Whoa. at a railway station is a nice, friendly gesture. Um, Peter Jones has challenged again. He's slowing up to a point of hesitation. Yes, but he hadn't yet reached it. <laughs> Clement Freud has another point, and there are 24 seconds for seeing a friend off at a railway station starting now. Passing through the ticket barrier, there are a choice of platforms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged As they're one. jokingly called... Deviation, because if we're seeing a friend off, you wouldn't have any choice. There'd only be one platform they'd be leaving from. They couldn't be leaving from half a dozen. Yeah, but you still have a choice of platforms at a railway station. He you're seeing say... a friend off. You're not yes, but he did not blam- say... He did not say that you have a choice of platforms for your friend to go off yeah. from. The train might have left sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with the challenge, Kenneth. Well tried. More fool Clement... you. You don't know what side your bread's buttered, mate. <laughs> I'll get you outside. <laughs> All I know is that I try to be as fair as possible, and that's the best side to butter my bread. Um, Clement has another point, and there are 18 seconds left for seeing a friend off at a railway station, starting now. London Termini have refreshment kiosks at which you can entertain friends and give them sustenance. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged again. Deviation. Nobody would go to a railway station to entertain their friends. (laughs) (laughs) Kenneth, I think the audience has demonstrated that everybody's in sympathy, that nobody would deliberately go to a railway station (laughs) to entertain a friend at a British (laughs) railway kiosk. It's just a sort of macabre thing he would do. Come and have a party on St Pancras Station. (laughs) You you see the difficulty I have in decisions. One might say, well, uh, Clement Freud has such macabre ideas, he would try and entertain his friends at a (laughs) railway station kiosk. But I think the sympathy is with you on this one, Kenneth, so I agree with your challenge. You take a point and the subject, and there are 12 seconds left starting now. Well, of course you say, bon voyage, my darling, and would that I might plant. I haven't finished. I was going to say, would that I might plant an English kiss upon thy cheeks, because yes. I frequently plant them on people. But before, you, before you manage to plant anything, Peter Jones challenged you. What, what was your challenge, Peter? Well, you wouldn't say, my darling, to a friend. You haven't, don't know my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Why 
say to your friends, uh, Peter? I, I don't know, but th that particular endearment would uh, suggest that they were more than friends. They are, dear. Yes, we may be. You joke. Never had him on the show. Why asked him? <laughs> what? We want to know what else you're planting on British railway platforms, Kenneth. And you have six seconds to tell us starting now. Don't eat the egg sandwich is on the way because your breath will smell, as it always leaves the most displeasing odour. So always stick something fresh. <laughs> Well, Kenneth's kiss on his friend's cheeks and eating egg sandwiches put him into the lead at the end of that round. Quite right. I'm glad that got the spontaneous round of applause we all expected. <laughs> and, Sheila, it is your turn to begin. Going from the subject of seeing a friend off at a railway station, the subject now is simply my friends. Oh. Sheila, can you talk to us about my friends starting now? Well, I frequently call them my darling, whether they be very good or very bad. I often meet my friends on railway stations as well. I have a friend called Maureen who looks after me and is a dear. I have three sometime friends on this programme, depending on whether they're going to buzz me on this or not. And they have <laughs> Kenny well, I, I think it's a deviation because what? it's grossly unfair to say that we're sometime her friends. We've stuck by her through thick and thin. I knew her. I knew her when she was in a gutter, don't worry, dear. I knew her when she used to go around London on a moped. That's a fact. Well, you used to ride on the back. That's not that he's hoping for a satire. What a thing to say. Oh, dear. Oh. I thought you might have... Shut up, let it on about that. I'm going around with Ayakar now. I'm trying to put it on a bit. <laughs> Kenneth, what was your challenge? That yes, we are still her friend. You're still her yes, friend. Uh, sometime friend is deviation insofar as we remain her friends. Oh, it's a very subtle point. That's it's, true, so I will give it up. You think I'm... <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, you've made my life very much easier by doing that. Uh, uh, Sheila, an incorrect challenge, so you gain a point. 39 seconds left for my friends starting now. It's an interesting fact that I came into the life without any friends when I was born, and I will probably go out of it without any. Oh. Clement uh, Freud's <laughs> challenge first. Hesitation. Yes, there was a hesitation. Without. Yes, because you repeated oh. it and then you hesitated, you yes. see. You, yes. going, you might sometimes get away with it, because they miss it or generosity, no. All right, 30 seconds for you, Clement, on my friends starting now. When Mark Antony said, my friends, Romans and countrymen. Uh, Kenneth Williams, why have you challenged? Deviation. Mark Antony didn't say, my friends. What did he say? Come on. Friends. Just friends. Friends, yes. He might have said, my friends. He might have said, my darlings, if he <laughs> did. <laughs> Don't you put your in. <laughs> I meant you're oaring. Yes, that's funny. <laughs> In the way you go wrong in this you know, This is another one of those impossible situations because uh, in Shakespeare's play he says, you know, uh, friends, Romans, countrymen. Yes, so, so he didn't say it right, so yeah, I Yeah, but point. was Clement Freud quoting then or not? Yes, Were he said where Mark Anton, he said. He's just said Mark Anton, what are you talking about? <laughs> I think from the way he said it, it was obvious that he was definitely quoting and he misquoted, so therefore uh, it is, uh, Kenneth Williams has a point and 25 seconds for my friends starting now. They have come to me and sought to the Good God gave them to me. They came like the gentle rain from heaven upon my fevered brow, and all at once a great vision appeared. She and I, she the Hancock's challenge you on your great vision. When have your friends come from heaven onto your brow? This is. <laughs> you are an ignorant clock, you know. Well, you were quoting a bit of the quality of mercy. This isn't that's Emerson. My friends have come to me unsought. The good God gave them. That's Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson, right, an author of which you are obviously not familiar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the audience and our listeners who are still no, with us. Ladies and gentlemen and listeners, what are you talking about? You now know why Sheila Hancock said her like sometime, sometime friend, friend, Kenneth Williams. <laughs> <laughs> he sometimes is. How he... rotten of you to throw those words back in my face. <laughs> <laughs> you were throwing it up in Sheila's face, then you. He she got up... interrupted me in full flow. I was starving on the waters. I was launching on the waters of oratory, wasn't I? I was launching myself there. I was throbbing with it. And now you're well. ruined. It is, and you'll get going again. We've gained your confidence in you. You've gained a point in the process. And but you he's kept... crying. Look at him. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That's nice. That's encouraging. <laughs> that is nice, isn't it? <laughs> you were, you've been bored before now. I yeah. thought he was praying. 
Anyway, let's get on with the game. Kenneth Williams has a point for an incorrect challenge, and he has 12 seconds left for my friends starting now. They come to give us the sympathy and... Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged. They've come before. They've come before and they've come again. <laughs> Not in this round. Yes, yes. they have. Yes. Not in this round. Yeah, twice yes. in the last have. sentence. They've been coming very often in this round. I'm afraid. <laughs> Sheila has a point and there are nine seconds on my friends starting... She's just doing it to get in before the nine seconds. That's what I she's know, trying to do. I know, and that is part of the game. Oh, she's got in this time. <laughs> Sheila Hancock, you have nine seconds. My friends starting now. Clement, Kenneth, Peter, Nicholas, Ian, David, John, Frederick, Peter. Uh, Clement for this challenge. What? Deviation. They're all men. <laughs> I can believe that Sheila Hancock has plenty of men friends. Because That's the way she deviates. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't call that devious. If they were all women friends, I might think it was devious. They're all male friends, undevious and uh, quite natural and normal. Sheila has another point and she starts now. I couldn't possibly exist without them. So after that tumultuous round, uh, Sheila Hancock gained the extra point, by the way, for speaking with the witch. By cheating, by waiting, I've done all the spade work. Why don't, you admit, <laughs> why don't you admit it? You got points because you had incorrect challenges yes, against you. Yes, but that's poor recompense. It's poor recompense. Is it poor Tears recompense and... that you're still in the lead? Oh, am I? Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. And she, you're, you're one ahead of Sheila, who's in second place. And Kenneth, the subject is now with you. Something which I'm sure you can talk about. What Gladstone said in 1888. <laughs> <laughs> so, before you completely collapse, will you try and tell us what Gladstone said in 1888 in just a minute, starting now? It was an extremely long time. One whole year. And of course, he could have said loads and loads of things. <laughs> But one thing we do know is that he was a great Liberal Prime Minister and lost his seat. I mean, that is to say, he lost the Premiership. Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged you. You did lose both times. Yes, it was very definitely lost, lost, lost and lost. So Sheila oh, well, you see, I'm not doing that sort of thing, listening to people's mistakes. I just <laughs> listen to people talking. <laughs> <laughs> They've been very fair with you so far, uh, Kenneth. They, um, and that time, Sheila got in with a repetition of lost. She gains a You'll point. You'll get it back, because I've no idea what he said in 1888. <laughs> well, you have 40 seconds to try and tell us something what he said, Sheila, starting now. My girl, you should change your ways and leave the streets and become pure and good. I will help you. Come to my house and I will teach you how to become a good woman. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged Too good. Yes, uh, yes there were two good, yes. Uh, so you've got it back, just as Sheila said, with great panache and tenacity <laughs> and cute listening, and you're in there, still with the lead, and there are 28 seconds on what Gladstone said in 1888, starting now. But he certainly did say to a leather merchant, why don't you make a bag that would suit the things I have to carry instead of making them flat? And this bloke said, well, I'd be delighted to accommodate you, dear. Just step right in the shop and have a look round. Tell me the shape you've got in mind. And he said, well, it would begin at the top quite thin and then bulge a bit. So I can get all the bulky bits down there. He said, what are the bulky bits you're carrying? Uh, Kevin Freud has challenged. <laughs> Repetition of bulky bits. There were too many bulky bits, I'm afraid. Uh, Have you seen a Gladstone <laughs> So Clement has another point, and he has three seconds for what Gladstone said in 1888, starting now. My friends, Romans, and <laughs> Company. <laughs> Clement was waiting for the opportunity to get back and say that anybody could have said that at any time, and he decided that Gladstone said it. And so, speaking when the whistle went, he gained the extra point. He's crept up on Sheila, and uh, Kenneth is still one point ahead of Sheila, and still in the lead at the end of that round. Clement Freud, it is your turn to begin, and the subject is my favourite humorist. Can you talk to us about him for 60 seconds, starting... <laughs> <laughs> I must explain to the listeners. But a delightful smirk has come over Clement, uh, Kenneth's face because he hopes what Ke Clement Freud will say as he sits beside him. But, uh, Clement, well, who is your favourite humorist in 60 seconds starting now? My favourite humorist is a small, insignificant, middle-aged, dead Canadian <laughs> whose name <laughs> was Stephen Leacock. Uh, a man, I think, of enormous humour, panache, inventiveness, style, and creative ability. Among the most exciting things which he wrote was an essay called A Visit to the Bank, which encompasses the 
history of a man attempting to open a credit account at a savings institution in downtown Toronto. <laughs> All of which is untrue, but I would be bound to repeat words were I to emulate correctly the <laughs> essay. Peter Jones, you challenge why? <laughs> hesitation. No, there's no hesitation, Peter. No. We're all fascinated to see how he could keep going. That's his rhetorical style, you see. That's his exactly. rhetorical style. That is his rhetoric. It isn't really. He goes a bit faster, usually. But I don't think he quite reached that point of hesitation. Indeed. So I will give him the benefit of the doubt on this occasion and say there are 15 seconds, Clement, for you to continue with my favourite humorist starting now. So this male human being walked into a financial emporium and addressed the clerk in the following manner. I should like, he said, to open an account. To which the employee replied, certainly, will you walk this way? <laughs> Devious, that line. He didn't that, tell you the tagline. If I could walk like that, I wouldn't want an account. <laughs> and that definitely was not Stephen Leacock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dorothy, it was all to the fun. And also, he repeated the word account right at the beginning. He had but this I thought I was waiting for the end of the story because it had all seemed so unfunny up until then. I was waiting for the tag. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfunny as it was, it gained him some extra points and he's now taken the lead at the end of that round. Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin. The subject, so, oh, so apt for this game, truth. Can you talk to us on truth for 60 seconds, starting now? It's something that I don't believe is totally necessary in this life. Contrary to what you're taught when you're a child, I think it is sometimes very good to tell a white lie in order to preserve people's feelings. In fact, I think it's well nigh impossible to go through life always telling the truth unless you're a very nasty person. I mean, for instance, it wouldn't be kind to go up to Kenneth Williams and say, shut your face, as he often says to me, <laughs> although it may be truthful in order to keep him quiet. But I think... Uh, <laughs> Yes, hesitation is right, yes. Yes, the look on your face made her hesitate. That was what it was, Kenneth. So you have another point, Kenneth, for a correct challenge, and there are 27 seconds for truth starting now. Well, it has long ago been established, of course, that it is outside of man, and therefore not controlled by man. Uh, Clement Freud challenge first. Man. I hadn't finished. I was to say, I was about to say mankind. You interrupted, you said. <laughs> In that case, hesitation. <laughs> Actually, it's a very difficult thing to judge on, but I think we must be accurate here. You see, the others could have challenged, and you definitely said man. Oh, and give you it to him, dear. Give it. I don't know. <laughs> I'll lose if you're it. Going to I've say got it. humility, dear. I'll take a back seat. Are I'm not trying to attract attention. I'm not here for my own benefit. <laughs> I'm here Kenneth. to play the game, be constitutional. If that's your verdict, I'll abide by it. Cle Kenneth. As uh, Sheila said, are you being truthful? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point is this. If you're going to say mankind, you must say mankind like that and not man. And so Clement has another point. And there are 18 seconds for truth, Clement, starting now. When I joined the Boy Scouts, the law was crazy. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged you. Hesitation. Yes, indeed, yes. there was. He was intimidated by Kenneth Williams. No, 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 Peter, you have the subject, and there are 13 seconds for truth starting now. Take away the facts and bring me the truth, I said. And my small boy repeated these instructions to his younger brother and brought a jam jar full of tadpoles into the bedroom. <laughs> Peter Jones was speaking when the whistle went, and so he gained the extra point. Um, and also, I'm afraid I have to tell you, we have no more time to play just a minute uh, this week. And so it remains for me to give you the final score. As you might have guessed from the way things have been going, Peter Jones was just in fourth place. Sheila Hancock was only just in third place. <laughs> only two points behind <laughs> Kenneth Williams, who was only one point behind this week's winner, Clement Freud. We do hope that you have enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute, and from all of us here, goodbye.
The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. We present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And welcome once again to Just a Minute. And uh, once again, I'm going to ask our, our four uh, competitors of the game to try and speak for just one minute, if they can, on some unlikely subject that I will give them, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject which is written on the card in front of me. And according to how well they do this, they will gain points, or their opponents will. And if you don't yet know how you play the game, the rest should become obvious as we play it. As Sheila Hancock, will you begin the show this week? The subject is frozen food. Can you talk to us about that for just a minute, starting now? My lifestyle has completely changed since I bought a deep freeze. I recommend them to everybody, particularly if you are a working wife. You can thereby cook a lot of food in advance, put it in the deep freeze, and then you bring it out. Uh, Kenny Phillips has challenged, why? Freeze. Or why she go, you can get a lot of food and put it... Why do you talk naturally all it's that? For the same reason that you, you go like that. <laughs> and... <laughs> Mm. No, I know I got them down the queue outside giving them banknotes. <laughs> <laughs> We've all, they, you all find your ways of playing the game, and Sheila's finding this particular way very effective. Actually, so, I repeated deep freeze, too. I know, and they were very kind. They let you get away with it, mm -hmm. Sheila. And uh, as that challenge was not correct, you gain a point, Sheila. You keep the subject, and you have 45 seconds left for frozen food starting now. It means you can do a month's cooking in advance, or if you have a party and you have some leftovers, you just put them in tin foil and shove them in the cupboard which is frozen and bring it out at a later date. I think it is questionable whether food tastes as good after it has been frozen but nowadays things have to be convenient and therefore sometimes you sacrifice flavour. Anyway, food has been very deeply iced when you buy it from the shops so I see that it doesn't make a great deal of difference if you do it yourself. Also an advantage is if you have a lot of vegetables growing in the garden and a surplus, you can put them in this same place that I refer to. That whistle which Ian Messeter blows for us tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point. On this occasion it was Sheila Hancock. In fact, no one else has spoken at that round except Sheila Hancock, so nobody else has scored. It was good advert for deep And I would love too. to see a garden that has surpluses growing in it. <laughs> uh, the second round, we would like uh, Kenneth Williams to begin. And the subject, Kenneth, is art. Can you talk to us about art for 60 seconds, starting now? Well, I think it was Ruskin who said it's that which lifts up our spirits in the aesthetic sense and makes the world a more beautiful place to be in. There is a functional school of philosophy which maintains that a power works should look like one. And there is another school that maintains... Uh, Clement Ford is challenged. Schools. A repetition of school, mm -hmm. one school of thought and the other one, I'm afraid. Uh, so that was a correct challenge, so Clement gets a point for that, and he has 39 seconds with art starting now. 
39 seconds with art <laughs> could be said to be too long because of all the boring, tedious and unintelligent people I have met. Art must be the epitome of sheer... Um, <laughs> yes, yes, he couldn't think of any more adjectives to describe art, and so he dried up. Kenneth, you have a point, and there are 21 seconds for art starting now. Well, of course, the most beautiful example of this can be found in the National Gallery, and it is in called The Incredulity of Thomas. It is by a man called Giacchino, and it's interesting to note in his biography that he prayed every morning, which bears out the Michelangelo dictum that only a very moral man should be able to paint. <laughs> So, oh, Kenneth Williams' interesting dissertation on art gained him a number of points, in fact, two, and at the end of that round, he has two points, because he hadn't scored before. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The qualities that make up the ideal woman. That is the subject. So can you talk on it, Clement, for 60 seconds, starting now? The qualities that make up the ideal woman for me are silence, a complete adherence to the domination of man, <laughs> Sheila Hancock has challenged well, The whole thing is very kinky <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, actually Sheila yes uh, the, the, Anyway pause didn't it we were so, they, the, 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 the image was sufficiently devious for me to grant it to you oh. Sheila And there are 45 seconds left starting now Well I think she should be about 5 foot 8 tall Have nut brown hair and be uh, Kenneth Williams a challenge why? Deviation the subject is woman ideal woman Yes, what about it? Well, obviously, deviation. I mean, she's no object objectivity about it at all. That qualifies. She, she can still talk about what she thinks should, qualities will make up the ideal woman. She's a woman. She's entitled to an opinion. How can a woman have any objectivity about that subject? Obviously, this thing should be handled by a man. You better give it to me. I'll discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be saying in a minute we shouldn't have women on the programme again. Yes, there shouldn't be women on this show. It's, it's great. <laughs> Quite right. It's doing half the blokes out of work, and it out of job. <laughs> what you all do with the money? Yeah. I don't think you I should... I disagree with your challenge, Kenneth. So Sheila has another point. And there are 40 seconds left, Sheila, starting. Now. And she should be called Sheila Hancock. Oh! And blatant, <laughs> lovely face, Clement long Boyle's legs. Challenge. Why? Deviation. Why? <laughs> that isn't the quality. <laughs> She'd say it is. A very clever challenge. I thought it five is... foot eight was little enough of a quality <laughs> <laughs> to be called Sheila Hancock. Was... No, I quite agree. A All clever right, challenge, I Clement. I have to concede that I'm 37 not. Thirty-seven seconds for the qualities that make up the ideal woman, Clement. Back with you after your last thoughts, starting now. Her eyes should be golden, and in her hair. She would wear a bandana, and I would be there. <laughs> her teeth ought to be made of white, pearly enamel, and her lips should be ruby red. Where's the neck? Uh, Kenneth, there's a challenge. Why? Your hesitation. Kenneth, you have a point for a correct challenge of hesitation. 19 seconds left, starting now. One that would observe that the man, of course, is superior. Understand? Uh, Sheila Hancock's challenge that. I'm... Total deviation. Why? Rot. The man, of course, is superior. Yes, no. but he's entitled to say... But that isn't a quality of a woman. Oh, yes. To believe that. It's an opinion, In Kenneth perhaps. Williams' opinion, it can be a quality superiority which he's entitled to express in a just a minute. Mm -hmm. So he has another point, and there are 13 oh, seconds right, left right, on the subject, right. Kenneth, starting now. To accept the fact that she was the product of one of his ribs, as <sighs> is written in the great book, and that on the seventh day they should both have a rest. And... <laughs> One of the loveliest thoughts we've had in just a minute. Oh, the seventh day, they should both have a rest. <laughs> well, I'm in a cup of tea and an aspirin. I know, it doesn't matter. We've just paused to, to oh, linger on all God. the thoughts that that idea conjures up with a, having that as a female quality. Uh, Kenneth. But anyway, that particular quality in thought took you into the lead at the end of that round, Kenneth. And uh, no, it's all right. <laughs> It's Sheila Hancock's turn to begin, and we have another long subject. The qualities that make up the ideal man. Oh. So it's very apt, Sheila, that you should start on this one, and there are 60 seconds to go. <laughs> 
starting now. Well, it wouldn't be like any of this lot, I can tell you that. <laughs> I think the qualities that make up an ideal man are exactly the same as those that make up a similar woman. Because I don't think one should differentiate between the sexes. Humanity, compassion, uh, can intelligence. Can you a challenge? Why? Or deviation. You have to, you have to <laughs> differentiate between the sexes. <laughs> I mean, goodness gracious me, we both look very different, dear. <laughs> Haven't you noticed? I'm talking about the qualities that go to make up the ideal one. Actually, she was not in saying it, deviating from the subject on the card, so she has a point, and she has 44 seconds left, starting now. Intelligence, forbearance, a sense of humour, looking after your looks, but if you're not pretty, it really doesn't matter. Uh, Kenneth Williams... Look, this jump. is obviously all about me, and I think it's quite wrong. <laughs> It's quite wrong, you know, to draw attention to me in this way. Listen, It'll be my Nicky, turn next, and I've got to say it all over again. He's obviously dying to tell us about his ideal man, so let him... No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I very generously handed it to you, uh, Kenneth, because she's decided that... Um, I want to know. Go yes, on. Yes, she wants to know. <laughs> so you have a point from Sheila, and you have the subject from Sheila, and there are 35 seconds left to tell us the qualities that make up the ideal man starting now. Well, they were all contained in that paragon I would call the most virtuous of contemporary figures, Mahatma Gandhi, who, without any kind of worldly ambition, sat in that doty and adopted the diet and the regimen of the poorest of his people and set an example unequaled in nobility and fortitude and in humility for the rest Peter Jones challenged your dissertation right? repetition of humility yes you did have humility before and it was a good challenge though even though we were absolutely transfixed with a mood that you had created very cleverly as you talked about Mahatma Gandhi nine seconds for Peter Jones on the subject I agree, starting I agree. now Honesty, zest and humour, an enjoyment of life which can be shared with the opposite number, whatever <laughs> sex it might be. <laughs> yes, I did really. The opposite number, whatever sex it might be. That was line was drowned in the applause, Peter. Uh, you got a point for speaking when the whistle went, Peter Jones. You have crept up into last place. I haven't alongside. been creeping. <laughs> Well, you crawled up into, <laughs> into last place <laughs> alongside Clement Freud, yes, who is two points behind forward. Sheila Hancock, and she's <laughs> one point behind our leader, who is still Kenneth Williams. And, Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. Stop making faces at the audience, Kenneth, and concentrate, because it's your turn to begin. The subject's Suetonius. Can you talk about it for 60 seconds, starting now? He's certainly written some very titivating accounts of the more decadent Roman emperors, and I was engrossed with the things he said about Tiberius in that swimming pool of his in the villa at Capri, with all these other nudists larking about, and these <laughs> disgraceful paintings over the bed aid, which I believe got him going something rotten. <laughs> I think nowadays, of course, there would be a prosecution brought about it, but you could go about doing, roughly speaking, what you'd like, because you were thoroughly autocratic. In a way, it's a pity more of it don't go on nowadays. I'd like to induct... Sheila Hancock has challenged you. Is he still talking about whatever was on the card? He seems to be sort of generalising. No, I think that's a very good challenge. Yes, he, he's got off Suetonius and talking about what Suetonius wrote about and which is, uh, yes. you know, and what went on at that particular time. A very good challenge, Sheila. Everybody else was intimidated by his knowledge yes. of the subject, so they didn't challenge before. Sheila, you have a point. And 19 seconds for Suetonius, starting okay. now. Well, there was this fella, Fred Suetonius, who lived in Rome in 64 BC. <laughs> yeah. Clement for his challenge. Deviation. Yes, I agree. <laughs> if you'd said Fred Suetonius, who lived in Ryslip in 1968, he'd have got away with it. Clement has a correct challenge, and uh, 13 seconds for Suetonius starting now. There is a story which is almost certainly apocryphal about Suetonius, Tiberius, and Catalonius, who met in a lowly tea uh, shop. Kenneth Williams has challenged you, why? A deviation, because what? they could never have met anywhere. Suetonius wasn't alive in Tiberius's period. <laughs> this is why I said it was almost certainly apocryphal. <laughs> <laughs> he did say that, you know. So he actually gains a point for that and has five seconds left on Suetonius starting now. You see, I don't know Catullus, your sense on the area. other hand, <laughs> lived in a completely different century from that occupied by... <laughs> Thank you.
Well, Clement Freud was then speaking when the whistle went. He gained the extra point. And Peter Jones, your turn to begin. Cool. Things that make me angry. Can you talk about some of those things <laughs> in 60 seconds, starting now? They don't, really. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. Yes, but he hadn't started, so he has another point. <laughs> and things that make me angry, starting now. Haven't really ma been made angry by them, because they're inanimate objects, and you can't get all heated about things. Now, the people who make them, we are very fortunate in our area. We have a marvellous bakery where they sell crusty loaves, but on occasions when I have to buy bread that's wrapped and sliced, I am driven crazy by these huge lumps of stuff at either end. <laughs> Why do they do it? To make us waste it. Nobody can eat it. It's all soggy and damp and very unwholesome white. All the nourishment has been drained out of it systematically to make more money for the bakers. And the brewers also are not entirely innocent. <laughs> if you go up and down the country drinking beer, as I often do, and I hope one day you'll all join me, I'd like to take you now. In fact, I could do it. <laughs> If the king was a alleviation, his enjoyment of beer drinking is nothing to do with making things that make him angry. Yes, I'm afraid it will go. If I have enough beer, I can get very ugly. <laughs> Never twist, Peter, but too late. You were definitely gone, and you showed your anger in your face. It was magnificent, but you then got onto a very happy note, asking them all to join you for drinks. I agree with Kenneth's challenge. He gains a point, and there are five seconds left. Things that make me angry, starting now. Anyone that interrupts my conversational flow, I could really scream at. I'd have to bash their faces in. The, the Peter Jones has challenged you. <laughs> he said anyone, and it's about things, not people. Well, those are the things that make him angry. I disagree with your challenge. So everybody that's... is going to win except me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing very well, Peter. And uh, you have half a second, uh, Kenneth Williams, on things that make me angry starting now. Footsteps behind me, driving me mad. <laughs> Kenneth gained that extra point for speaking. When the whistle went, he's now increased his lead, so uh, he is now the outright leader at the end of that round. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. Subject, tiddlywinks. Can you talk to us on tiddlywinks for 60 seconds, starting now? Tiddlywinks is a game which many people think is played solely by children, whereas, in fact, adults all over the country indulge in it. At most major universities, there are tiddlywink clubs, and comparatively grown-up people stand around a blanket on which there's a cup and a number of plastic discs of different colours, the idea being to depress the larger tiddlywink with an even greater wink of yet a different hue and project it into the container placed in a prominently circular uh, position can, in the centre of... Yes, I think there was a hesitation. 25 seconds for you on Tiddlywinks, Kenneth, starting now. I once saw this play in a public house. It was in the East End of London, and I was really quite attracted by it. I saw them flipping up and down. I thought, oh, a charming game. I said, do you win anything at it? They said, no, not in money, actually. Oh, I said, well, not in I don't even pay for money. I'm sure you're going to make uh, five pounds. Clement is challenged. Repetition of money. There was too much money flowing around that pub, <laughs> He has a correct challenge and nine seconds for Tiddlywink starting now. I was requested not long ago by the faculty of Newcastle to come and be president of their Tiddlywink Society, a job which I accepted... <laughs> Clement Freud was then speaking when the whistle went. He gained the extra point, but he's still in second place behind our leader, who is still Kenneth Williams. Sheila's still in third place, and Peter Jones still in fourth. And Sheila Hancock, your turn to begin. The subject, inexperience. Can you talk to us from the wealth of your experience about inexperience starting now? Well, I am a very inexperienced tiddlywink player. However, I have a bash at it. I also am less experienced than the other members of the team at playing just a minute, as I only guest on it occasionally. However, I am lovable and I don't mind losing. I also... Oh. <laughs> Kenneth Williams' challenge to what? Well, it's nothing, nothing to do with um, their experience, is it? I mean, it's all to do with whether she's good at gamesmanship and things like that. Oh, it's I said I'll totally right. If I'm you'd saying. had her for hesitation, I would have agreed. But to my mind, she'd have firmly established that oh, she... Oh, well, give it to her! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, she said she had less experience, which is uh, in, more inexperienced in just a minute than you others, and I think it was quite clear what she was talking about. And there are 42 seconds for you to continue, Sheila, on inexperience, starting now. Actually, it is a quality that I think I find rather attractive. I don't like people who are cocky and know what it's about. I would rather see somebody slightly hesitant. I think there's nothing more endearing than a child who's not quite sure how to do something. And certainly, as far as performers are concerned, there can be a great deal of charm in somebody who isn't glib and slick and stylish, which is probably the attraction of a lot of the pop artists today. And <laughs> Peter Jones, as he so obviously pointed to himself to show us. I also think that Nicholas Parsons is the absolute antithesis of this. He is a very experienced chairman, and if I were to be in his position... <laughs> Well, she started with the subject and she finished with the subject. She gained two points. She said some very nice things. And thank you for the personal ones too, Sheila. And Kenneth, your turn to begin. The subject, difficulties. Something I think you know a great deal about. <laughs> You're not always in them. You often create them. And uh, <laughs> would you talk about them for 60 seconds starting now? Well, the difficulties in my life largely consist in comprehending the mathematically monumental things. If they tell me the difference between five shillings and eight, I will, roughly speaking, know what they're talking about. But if they discuss me, Millions and megawatts, then I am lost. The bicycle sheds that are built for the Nuffield workers can be understood. But the idea of an atomic reactor costing 30,000 million can't be understood. Clement at all. Has challenged Consequently, you. there is no way we can discuss this rationally. <laughs> Clement has challenged you, Kenneth. Why? Repetition of millions. Yes, there was more than one millions. And so, Kenneth, uh, Clement has a correct challenge, and he has 24 seconds for difficulties starting now. One of the great difficulties for me is flying a Harrier jet, because it has more levers and buttons, charts, gauges, wind vanes, and other instruments than I am able to comprehend. As a result, I go up and find it terribly difficult to come down. Many people will think this is an advantage. <laughs> Well, Clement Freud's difficulty, speaking when the whistle went amongst them, uh, uh, while well, on the subject, uh, gained him the extra point and took him into the lead alongside Kenneth Williams at the end of that round. It's still a very close contest, and Peter Jones, your turn to begin. And the subject is, from difficulties, follies. Can you talk to us on the subject of follies, 60 seconds, starting now? I am reminded of the famous ones that happened during the First World War, or perhaps even earlier, Harry Pellissier's famous follies, and the ones invented by Flo Ziegfeld at the New Amsterdam Theatre in New York in about 1905, 6, 7 and 8, and ran for many years after that, glorifying the beauty of the American woman. And many famous comedians took part in these follies. Uh, Will Hay was one of them, and um, W.C. Fields, <laughs> and uh, a number of people. Uh, I Sheila know. Hancock has helped you out. You I'm shout about sorry, but he is hesitating, isn't he? He keeps saying, um, uh, and... Uh, yes, he uh, is, really. But Will Hay was, was never in the Siegfeld follies, I don't think. No, I couldn't <laughs> think of the... Uh, <laughs> that's why I hesitated, because I, uh, <laughs> I knew he wasn't. I know, I can see it in your face, too. Uh, some other... Will Rogers, I was Will Rogers, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, anyway, Sheila had you for hesitation rather than deviation, and uh, you, uh, Sheila had 18 seconds left for the follies starting now. It is folly to be wise. I was once in the follies myself, and the opening number <coughs> went... Uh, Kenneth Williams challenged you first. Hesitation. Yes, hesitation, and I must remind you this is the last subject to, to the show because we haven't any time at the end of this game. Um... Follies, with you, 12 seconds left, Kenneth, starting now. Well, of course, it would be ridiculous and foolish if I were to take all my clothes off in the middle of Piccadilly Circus. If, on the other uh, hand, I did... Sheila Hancock has challenged you, why? Deviation, I don't think it would be foolish at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've got these see-through briefs. Oh. No, it wouldn't be a folly, it would be a misdemeanour. <laughs> <laughs> 
It might be a folly if he got into trouble for it. So I disagree with the challenge. Kenneth has another point, and there are four and a half seconds left for follies starting now. Once I committed one by being the fairy on top of the Christmas tree and spread light and joy of blessed Jesus. Kenneth Williams was speaking then when the whistle went. He gained that extra point. He also gained points for his follies throughout that round. And as I said a little earlier, this was to be the last round in this week's show. So I must now give you the final score. As you might have guessed from the way things have been going, Peter Jones was just in fourth place. Sheila Hancock was only just in third place. <laughs> Clement Freud was barely in second place. But undoubtedly, this week's winner is Kenneth Williams. <laughs> We do hope that you have enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute, and from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messeter and produced by David Hatch.